Blackman to complete some of these balls. They're going to try and pressure Williams from the pocket. Williams cuts it loose and incomplete. Intended on the play for D. Wiggins, who's gone three ball games without a reception for Miami. And Duke posts a three and out, as Miami did, behind the coverage of Josh Blackwell. Well, this is going to be the story for the entire ball game. If Miami gets to these third downs, can they create separation? And more than that, can they make contested catches? Duke's going to play man to man. They're going to pressure you. You're going to have to make plays in one on one situations. Miles Hudzik took the punt return duties for the Blue Devils a couple of weeks ago when Blackwell was sidelined. And he'll wait on the offer of Lou Headley. 46 yard average. Fourth in the ACC on Levick Nashley. And he wedges it. And it will check back up and stay in Miami territory. Not a great punt by Headley. Both teams go three and out. And as a line of demarcation for this Duke team, just look at the difference in yards per play. Two yards less per play. Almost a yard and a half per rush. And then the yards per pass difference. Third downs way down since that Virginia Tech game. And a lot of it's because you then have film on a quarterback who's a first-year starter in Quentin Harris, and he's really struggled. And here's an early chance for David Cutcliffe's team maybe to take advantage of excellent field position from the Miami 39 and Harris will be sacked and that was Rousseau Eric you talked about big 15 at the top and he's at work early yeah he is at work and he's working against number 63 Jacob Munt a true freshman that is a freshman on freshman matchup and Greg Rousseau at 6'6 260 60 pounds is a prototype defensive end he his name will be called early in the draft and we will see him play on Sundays look like we got a little movement in the line number 99 for Miami five yard penalty second it's on Noruka and, and and Wes, the, the R R Greg Rousseau has the potential to have a big game today. The the Duke tackles last week struggled against Wake Forest. Boogie Basham, yep. one of the best pass rushers in the entire conference. I expect Greg Rousseau to have a big day. Deion Jackson, and not much there. So Miami gives up the penalty, and now Quarterman, the linebacker, in his 51st career start. Talk about leaving a legacy. And benefiting from one. Think about all the great linebackers. You're talking about 51 starts for Shaq Quarterback. Straight ahead, Jackson that time shoots the gap on the replay. First down, Duke to the 25 of Miami. Roddy, almost the same play. They just run different routes here. Well, and, and Miami's in a different set. You get a little stunt in the middle because it's third down and they're trying to create some pressure. FIU had success doing this in third and medium to longs, running draws. Letting the pass rush go by and getting first downs. Jackson one more time. Miami rallies a little tighter around the football that time. A couple of yards maybe for Deion Jackson. Junior from Pace Academy in Atlanta. Comes in as the Blue Devils leading rusher. Just under 600 yards, which is 13th in the ACC. Here's Harris. Got a block from Jackson. There was a flag thrown and now a sack by Jonathan Garvin. Neil Garvin had a pretty clear path to the quarterback. Yeah, he did. And again, John Garvin lined up on one of those five. freshman tackles. Chop block. Offense, number 25 and number 67. That penalty is declined. Result of play, third down. Rock Chambers and Deion Jackson on a chop block. Well, you get these from time to time when you have an offensive lineman going up high. Deion Jackson actually kind of misses, catches the leg of Pinckney, but it doesn't matter because John Garvin's able to get in the backfield, and now it's third long for Duke. Yep. Yeah, you're right, Rod. You have to have a lot of communication when the running back is going to cut and pass protection so you don't get that chop block call. Harris team one up for the end zone. Over the shoulder and dropped by Hardy. <laughs> Well, Wes, in our meetings yesterday, the Duke coaches told us we're going to be aggressive, a double move on third down, and Harding just gator arms it. Isn't able to make the catch. You have to wonder. Did Offense. That penalty is the climb. Result of play, fourth down. I have to wonder, did the rain play part of that as he looks up in the air and it's going over his shoulder? But that's a play that you have to make, although with the penalty, it likely wouldn't have mattered anyway. Right. So now the field goal try. Remember a couple of weeks ago, A.J. Reed hit from 51 yards. This will be inside of that. 47 for Reed to put Duke on the board. 
try from the middle is no good. Tugged it left. So Reed, just his third miss of the season. Manny Diaz's team gives up short field and survives. No score in Durham. His job with his program. Tough year for him here, but clearly a team that could be a factor next year for sure. First down give and banging away is Harris. Remember, DJ Dallas, Manny Diaz announced an injury off last Saturday night in the loss to Florida International. Not only missing this week, but also missed the postseason appearance the Canes have, but they do expect him back, obviously, in the spring and that kind of thing. Yeah, and you, you wish DJ Dallas a speedy recovery. A true leader on this team, not just on the offensive side of the football, but the way that he carries himself, his teammates on both sides of the ball really respect him. Here is Williams to throw and offline looking for the tight end Mallory will Mallory's become a big target Brevin Jordan's had an injury and Mallory has got eight balls for 158 and a couple of scores he had four for 71 last Saturday yeah it was a career high last week was was really good against FIU in a situation where FIU plays a lot of man coverage much like this Duke team I expect him to be one of the targets today that that Jaron Williams tries to go to, but another third and long, a down and distance that Duke's going to play press coverage and make, likely mix up the pressures. Osborne, Mike Harley, Jeff Thomas all in the set here with the tight end Mallory. Williams wants the throw, tried to slip it back and almost intercepted. Tried to get it to Harley. Hayward stuck a hand in there, and it was actually Quan's also involved in the deflection here, I believe. Well, it was pressure that flushed him out of the pocket, and oh, Shaka Hayward almost had the interception just the reaction there from the linebacker not able to reel it in but there wasn't anybody in front of him had he been able to make that catch Michael Carter who was defending the play for the Blue Devils and then Hayward the very talented freshman redshirt who they're excited about almost came with the pick so here's Lou Headley again to punt back to back three and outs for Miami Duke has missed the field goal off the short field opportunity a moment ago and Headley this time a little better looking from a punt perspective, it'll bounce up into the hands of Hudson. And he'll be taken out of bounds around the 27-yard line. And so just ahead of nine minutes, we're scoreless, and David Cutcliffe's team back to work after the 49-yard punt. Well, he's done a marvelous job. We said a moment ago, Roddy, he's changed the dynamic of Duke football is the bottom line. Well, seasons like this at Duke have become the anomaly where once upon a time they were the norm. Seasons not making a bowl game. Uh, just look what he's done since 2012. He needed a little bit of time coming right. into 2008 to get his guys in to be able to change the culture. But since then, Duke has become a winning football program. Yep. First down give, Jackson. And Scott Patchen, the defensive end, makes the play. And, of course, two times the ACC Coach of the Year. It is important to note that in that number before he arrived here, Roddy, Duke had an eight-year stretch where six times they went winless in ACC play. In, in eight side, consecutive defense, years, right before contact, his arrival. Six times they did not win a conference game. Second down. And, and he has made Duke a place that, that cares about football. I mean, when I played here, there right. was a track around the stadium which just didn't make it feel like a big-time ACC school. Indoor practice facilities now been built. The facilities have been upgraded. And not only that, but the product on the field has been there as well. Here's Jackson trying to squeeze something to the edge. And boy, Miami's right there. That's Michael Pinckney. We told you Quarterman making his 51st career start. Well, tonight is Pinckney's 47th. Pretty handy if you're Manny Diaz. Absolutely. And another third down. Last time Duke went to the one on one coverage to the bottom, bunch to the top. Here's Harris on the key. And Quinn Harris is going to be short. Started the dive about a yard shy, I believe, at the 36. Gervin Hall out of the secondary was there. And for quarterbacks, it's where you start the dive or the slide, not where you finish it. And Quentin Harris just not the awareness to realize that he's got to get past the 37-yard line to be able to get it. Dives at the 36, ball is spotted. Looks like Duke's going to go for it. Yep. Maybe a couple of steps for... Quentin Harris. And 
right now. The ruling on the field is that the runner will stop short of the line of the game. The previous play is under further review. The spot is being reviewed. And we get another look here. The replay official is Joe Ryder. Upstairs here with us at Wallace Wade Stadium. And, and I thought just seeing it live, uh, I thought that was a good call. I thought it was a good spot based on, yeah. on, on where he started. And honestly, where he finished. I mean, it, his knee didn't hit far from where he started that little dive. But you'd like to see your quarterback in that situation put his head down and just burrow forward. And I don't think there's anything definitive from the view that we just saw to be able to change the spot. The only benefit might be that he was sliding forward rather than kind of like the baseball slide. That's true, yep. Yeah, but it, it's kind of a gray area too because yep. he, it's almost a sideways slide. If he dives forward, you get that. I always told my quarterbacks, we don't want you taking shots, but there's crucial times in games. And, and you know what? When you're a heavy underdog like Duke is today and it's senior day and you're fighting for a shot at possibly getting a bowl game on third and three, that's a, that's a time where it's... It's okay to take a shot in that situation, Quentin Harris. You go get that first down. And I'm, again, so so right there it looks like the ball would be passed. Right. The line to game, but we'll see. After we'll further review, the ruling on the field stands. There you go. Fourth down. Yeah. Right. Your points. You don't have a view right down the line. There's no one. Of, there's not one of the big five-yard lines that you're able to, to really see exactly where he is. And from the views that we had, there's just nothing there to overturn it. And now Duke's going to send out the punch. Number two is now wearing number 84. Aha. Uh -huh. So we told you earlier, this is Trajan Bandy, or K.J. Osborne, that's returning the punts. But last time it was 84 he was wearing, which is the number of a defensive lineman, Josh Neely. That ball is hammered, by the way, from Parker. Osborne backs up. And got corralled inside the 10. Now trying to make some change and get shoved out of bounds around the 10 yard line. 52 yard punt. No score. And they've been out without number 51, their defensive end, Victor Demukeji. He got rolled up on the screen play, and he is a very productive player for the Blue Devils. Eight and a half sacks on the season was really dominant last week. If they are without him for the rest of the game, they will miss him greatly. Drew Jordan is spelling him, Eric, at the defensive end spot. Miami off its 10, and whoa, what a collision in the box. Robert Burns and Kobe Kwanzaa slammed the door shut on Burns, and then you see the help with Taj Rice, 53, making the play, but boy, Kwanzaa was having none of it. This is the third start to a Miami drive, and third time they start out with a run, and not a great gain on first down. They've gone to passes. Each of the last two times, it's become fairly predictable early in this game. Run for a short game, then throw the ball and try and get the first down. Williams from the gun. Far side throw, Osborne stepped out of bounds ahead of the first down. Two yards shy, so from the 18, Leonard Johnson was over there for the Blue Devils. Here's where Miami Last week, there was frustration that they didn't run the ball more. Here on a third and two, despite the lack of success that they've had, I, I want to see them try and run the ball. Try and get this on Duke, especially with the rain. Again, Duke's going to come up and play tight coverage. Going to make it tough to complete one of those passes. What does Miami do on this third down? Two by two look. Quick toss. Harris trying to get to the edge, and the Blue Devils really make the play and that was dylan singleton young man from just north of atlanta decula georgia bringing the hammer well, i like the physicality on both sides singleton and cameron harris if you look at marquise waters there on the waters, perimeter yep. going low and coming up with the stop but miami opts to go with the toss to the outside couldn't quite get jakai clark the guard around to get a block on any of those perimeter defenders and Fourth and short means another punt. Six possessions, six three and outs, Roddy. Yeah. And throw in the missed field goal now, but it was still three downs and a snap, right? And, and the rain may have something to do with that. You know, we don't know how that's affecting the game, but uh, these two offenses have really struggled so far. Lou Headley would like to drive one here to Hudson. And a fair catch call for and made around the 37-yard line. No score. 5-12. It's Wake Forest. 
Mateo Durant has come into the ball game wearing number 21 with Quentin Harris at the quarterback spot. A couple of yards there to the 39. Jonathan Garvin, the stop for Miami. Senior from Wilton, Connecticut, in his final game. His dad, Kevin, a player at Georgia in the early 1980s. Team first guy for Vince Dooley back in the day. Second down, nine. And here's Quentin trying to get around the edge and cannot break away from Neo Garvin that time. Big time play by Garvin. Rousseau's got some numbers, but Garvin was the one who started the year with a lot of promise. Roddy, and he's been pretty good, too. Yeah, and he basically plays both the dive and the quarterback on the zone read, collapses down, is able to use his athleticism to get and track down Quentin Harris before he's able to get around the edge. And this is not a situation that, that Duke wants to be in. With their struggles protecting, I'd expect something conservative, a draw or a screen. Blue Devils 0 for 3 on third down so far. Harris shoots a first down pass, and it's caught, and that's Calhoun. Across the midfield line, we were looking forward to seeing Jalen Calhoun today. We certainly were, and, and Miami only rushes three. They drop Bader in zone coverage, and Calhoun just finds a little soft spot. Quentin Harris has nobody in his face, is able to deliver the football, and it's a big first down for Duke. Just the second completion of the ball game for Harris, who's going to throw here on first down. Looking for the shot, that's Aaron Young, the senior from California. Deep downfield near the 22-yard line of Miami, and the Blue Devils got a little something cooking in the pass game. They certainly do. We're seeing the aggressiveness with shots downfield. Look like cover two. And Young just finds the soft spot in the zone behind the corner on the sideline. Nice pass by Quentin Harris again. 41 yards in back-to-back -back throws. Here's Harris, Bobo on the reverse. He wants to throw, loads it up, and look for Noah Gray inside the five. Well, that almost went all sorts of wrong for Duke. It's a, it's a really nice play by Jake Bobo in the yeah. backfield with the spin move to get away from that. The pass left something to be desired, but I, I, I'll forgive him because that spin move in the backfield. Got to pull the trigger, didn't he? Exactly. <laughs> Second down and 10. Durant stays in the game. Here's Harris looking to throw again. That time Bobo got caught up with Al Blades and couldn't shake free of the coverage. So now third the full 10 for Duke. With third and ten coming up, I would not expect to see another three-man rush. I expect four-man pressure, possibly even one of Miami's exotic blitz schemes that they'll bring from time to time, and that would be very tough on the two freshman tackles for Duke. Here's Harris. In Indiana beat Purdue in overtime at West Lafayette with Roddy Jones and Eric Wood, West Durham. Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham on this final day of play in college football with That's not going to a postseason game. The Blue Devils four and seven have lost five straight and six of the last seven, but yet have kind of dictated a little bit more of the tempo of this opening period than have the Canes. And A.J. Reed, who missed earlier from 46, going to try from 40 here for the first points of the game. And the field goal is good. So A.J. Reed gets a 40-yarder here. A really good job by the kicker of coming back after missing earlier and drilling this one but, but a nice drive by Duke converting a third and long to be able to extend the drive another explosive play down the field on the pass to Aaron Young being able to get some points on the board the way these two offenses are playing points are going to be at a premium and really it's because of the way the defense are playing these are two really good units on the defensive side of the football Blue Devils have been without Victor Dean Bukaji an outstanding defensive end who's lost on the second play he is back on the sideline. Whether or not he enters the lineup, we'll see. But, Roddy, the, the ball game's kind of been a bit of a standoff so far. Duke's had the better threats, the missed field goal, and the one converted there. Yeah, the, and their defense has played really well against this Miami offense so far. Being able to stop the run on a third and short, being able to, to, to defend in one-on-one -on -one situations, tight man coverage. They've made plays. Miami has not yet. That's why Duke's on the board first. Eight plays, 40 yards. Just better than two minutes for the Reed field goal to give the Blue Devils the three nothing lead. And Jeff Thomas and KJ Osborne are deep for Miami. And the kick 
will be handled by Thomas. Thomas can really run now. Brought down at the 30 yard line. Blue Devils cover it. Shaka Hayward, the redshirt freshman. Don't forget, coming up at tonight at 7, 6 Central on ESPN and the ESPN app. Heisman Opal Joe Burrow, number two LSU, trying to stay perfect. Host Texas AM. Of course, this is a replay of last year's 74 72, seven overtime game at College Station. Tigers looking for a little revenge after they were denied a 10 win season a year ago on that. You get the feeling that LSU, if they can put up a big number in that game, they are going to try and throw everything they have at Texas AM. Here is Williams, and he's sacked. The Blue Devils get around there, and Trey Hornbuckle in his final game. Just a really nice job of Trey Hornbuckle being able to beat Zion Nelson, the left tackle, get in the backfield, and then bring down Jared Williams. Williams is fortunate that he's able to hold on to this ball because he's got it away from his body, and Hornbuckle does what you're supposed to do, swatting at the football. It's a nice job by Williams of holding on to it, making sure the ball didn't hit the ground. And big Navon Donaldson is hurt for Miami in that offensive line. Junior from Miami Central. 34 career starts, including tonight. Boy, it looks like it's the right knee for the big man. So second down and 14 here for Williams. John Campbell has come in to replace Donaldson. Williams zips it down the field for Osborne and broken up on the play by Leonard Johnson. You know, guys, we talked to Matt Guerrero, the defensive coordinator, yesterday extensively. It's been tough for Duke this year at times, but I really like this secondary. Well, and he's really excited about him as well. He's not afraid to play man-to-man -man coverage. They're going to come up and press. And if I'm Matt Guerrero, there's not really one of these Miami receivers that terrifies me enough to not come up and press in any situation. So the, the fact that they are a young defense who's aggressive, they're one of the funnest defenses in the conference to watch on film. They are third, by the way, in pass defense and conference play. Here's Williams, flush from the pocket. And that's Mallory, the tight end, who makes the play. And I believe is going to be maybe a step shy of the first down. They measure him just beyond the 38-yard line, but a great catch by Mallory for 13. Yeah, Jaron Williams escapes from the pocket. A nice job by him. The pocket was closing around him, but Waters just brings Mallory down short of the line to gain. Miami sends out the punt team. That's one of those situations where in man-to-man -man coverage, Miami's going to run a crossing route, one of those routes you can just run away from the defender. But a good play by Waters, bringing him down short. Four straight three and outs for offensive coordinator Dan Enos in Miami to start the ball game. Headley's going to keep it on the fake. Look at the big guy from Australia take off. And Lou Headley's got a first down for Miami. Former Australian rules football player, Lou Headley, 6'4", 230, Roddy, and can run. Well, when you brought down the snap, too, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if he can run, but there was so, so much, there was so much space on the left side of that formation that it didn't really matter if he was a burner. The fact that he had blockers out front made it really easy to get the first down. Uh oh, nice call by Miami in a situation where they haven't been able to get anything going on offense. Well, let's see if Enos' offense can get it rolling here. Bunch look left. They're going to flip it to Osborne. Sweep to the wide side. There's a flag down as Singleton makes the tackle. He and Waters were both there for the Blue Devils. Kwanzaa was lurking. Holding offense number 51. 10-yard penalty remains for the foul. DJ Scaife, the right tackle. With this big momentum shift after the fake punt, Danny Nose and his offense need to get in the end zone. Last week, shut out in the first half by FIU. That led to their very, very disappointing loss last week. And Eric, it kind of created some frustration on the defense, it seemed like. A defense that was put in some adverse situations early with the turnover. Absolutely right. And that's why Manny Diaz challenged his defense to play passionate throughout this whole game. He said they got frustrated last week. They were just on the field so much because of the the offensive struggles. Williams tries to rip it to Osborne this time up top. KJ a great catch and will scramble all the way down to the 35. 
Can't say enough about the grad transfer from Buffalo and what he's meant to Manny Diaz's team this year. Comes in leading Miami in receptions with 42. But Roddy, not only leading them statistically, he's a grad transfer that you feel like's really provided leadership for a team through some of those uh, tough waters. Yeah, it's a, it's a fairly young receiving group. And, and K.J. Osborne has been able to be sort of the, 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 the voice of reason in the room. And yep. He's selected to go to the ACC media days without ever playing a game in the used uniform. Harris trying to sweep to the right. First down and more. And Miami now almost sparked from a momentum standpoint by the fake punt from Headley. And now the Canes have something going. Well, they're able to get some blocks out on the edge. Look at big number 51, DJ Scape. Get out front. Cam Harris makes Dylan Singleton miss in the hole. And you're starting to feel, all right, this Miami offense, because of that fake punt and the big first down that came from it, is starting to feel themselves a little bit now. Tell you what, if I had one of those Eric Wood types out in front, I could probably run for a yard or two. <laughs> Take a break. A quarter. In. Well, David Cutcliffe's team's got a 3 0 lead as we go to quarter two. The second quarter's been awfully good to his offense. They've scored 38% of their points in the second 15 minutes. But, Roddy, it's the defense that's got to hold the rope here. Yeah, Miami with a first and 10 here after gaining a little bit of momentum after that fake punt. Here is Williams going up top. Osborne had it broken up on the play by Josh Blackwell. We got a flag down. Let's we'll see if they get Blackwell for running up Osborne's back here a little bit. Trey Blake, the referee. Pass interference. Defense, number 37. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Thank you, man. Correction, that foul was on number 31. There we go, Josh yeah, Blackwell Josh indeed. Just got there a little bit too early. It looked like you see his hip on the back. His hand on the back hip of KJ Osborne. I actually don't know. I, yeah. I think that's a let him play. There's a little bit of contact early, but the refs call it. Cameron Harris touchdown Miami. Well, the fake punt guys ends up being a touchdown. And, and when you call a play like that, Wes, that, this is exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to spark your team. Not only are you trying to gain field position, but spark your team, your offense to get something going. And an offense that had been mostly dormant to that point found a little bit of life. The pass interference certainly helps, but then Cameron Harris right up the middle into the end zone. Seven plays, 62 yards. Just ahead of three minutes, Miami's in front. And Camden Price, who's taking over the place-kicking duties, makes it a four-point lead now for the Canes. So the man from Australia, Lou Headley, goes about 15 yards on the fake punt. Three plays later, the Canes are in front. I'll tell you what, remember, Roddy, we saw DJ Dallas leave the Georgia Tech game earlier this year. Harrison hit the Jackets for 100 yards that day. Look, Cameron Harris is a talented running back. The only reason he hasn't been the primary ball carrier is because of how good DJ Dallas is. Dallas, of course, will miss the regular season and postseason after an injury. Here's Phil Yaw Johnson again on the kick return. Look out. Guy's got some lightning in a bottle, and he gets across the 35, and a horse collar coming on Miami. Phil Yaw Johnson has had personal foul. Quite an impact here in the last Kicking game. Number 23. Good start for the Blue Devils. Be first now. And let's check with Kevin Connors. All right, Wes, your AT&T best performance takes us to Jordan Hare. Bo knows the Iron Bowl. Bo Nix on the keeper. Auburn has three losses, all to currently ranked top 10 teams. They're up 7-3 on number five right now after one. Wes? Kevin, thanks very much. Plus field territory for the Blue Devils, who now trail for the first time in the ball game, And Deion Jackson carves out about four on first down. And the Blue Devils a little tempo here now, Roddy. Well, they told us they were going to try and go fast against a stout Miami front seven. Jackson a first down and to the 35 before he's finally wrestled down by Silvera. 
One of the advantages of Duke going fast is they're, is they're trying to tire out this Miami front seven. They're going to run the football so that later in the game it starts to pay dividends and them having success. Harris trying to make a quick throw. Aaron Young, his second catch of the ball game. A couple of yards shy at the 27. Robert Knowles coming over the top in coverage. And the other thing, Wes, that that tempo does is it likely simplifies the coverages that quarterback Quentin Harris is going to see. Harris on the keeper, and he will fight to the 25. Boy, Jonathan Garvin has been impactful here in this first half. Got to mark Harris half step short. Duke on the year, just 32.8% on third down in conference play. They come in 118th in the country at 33 and a third in the regular season. Six of 31 the last two games, by the way. Here's Harris. Call draw, first down. Not much more, though, behind Quarterman stock. And I like the way Harris finished that run for a first down. We saw him the last time we critiqued him, and we said, when it's your senior day, when, every, when your season's on the line on third down, you have to go get that first down. And I love the way he lowered his shoulder, lowered his head there, and got the first down. And he would. How about the block by Rakavius Chambers, the right guard? Harris going to throw for the end zone, and it got deflected. Romeo Finley, I think, or Robert Knowles. Robert Knowles got a hand in. So Knowles gets a hand in on a ball headed for Eli Panko here. Just barely. You see Knowles' feet there on the hash, is able to get off the hash, get over to the seam route, and knock that ball down. If he's not able to do it. I'm not sure Panko comes up with the diving catch, but a great play. Here's Harris, going to keep it again. Good blocking. Quentin Harris will score. Some runs are tougher than others. Well, after that third down where he goes and he slides and it's not quite close enough, Eric talked about the, the physicality that he had on the run on this third down. And then here he's able to break a tackle again. Miami struggled last week in third and long situations or in man-to-man -man situations with some of these draws. Their quarterback draw, man-to-man, -man, you make one guy miss in the safety, and it's to the house. So two minutes after Cameron Harris scores for Miami, Quentin Harris scores for Duke. It's a Harris party. Nice. Nice. The point after from Reed is good. 10-7 Blue Devils. Pretty good run, Roddy. Really nice run. He's able to get through the hole. He makes Robert Knowles miss. You're going to be walking out on senior day, but but ultimately have to temper your emotions because you have a football game to play, you would. Yeah, absolutely. In, in my senior day, we didn't make a bowl game, so that was my last game in the UofL yeah. uh, uniform, and, and it was a sad day, and it's emotional, like you said, and that makes some of these games often unpredictable because of all the emotion that goes into it. Short kick. And this will be handled by Thomas. And Jeff Thomas taken down at the 20 yard line. That's where Miami starts. Well, week 14 of the college game means week 13 and NFL Sunday countdown. Starts at 10 a.m. Eastern. On the countdown crew on ESPN and the ESPN app, they'll look at the legend of Lamar Jackson and how that was born. Randy Moss ranks this week's best college football catches. And the top turkey bowl play from across the country. Early breaking stories, injury updates, and previews of each game right up until kickoff presented by Snickers. You and he Wood had a little early NFL football this week, a little Thanksgiving ball. Yeah, we got your week 13 going early. There's a play fake by Williams. And Jaron Williams doesn't run much, but picks up five there before Singleton. Helped him out of bounds. Wes, you mentioned the legends of, of Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson, that legend almost never got started, or maybe it would have if he was playing receiver, but I know <laughs> from experience being around the University of Louisville program, a lot of schools recruited him at safety, at wide receiver. University of Louisville said, you're a, you're a playmaker. You come here, you can play any position you want, and let's put him at quarterback. Well, and remember this, he and Reggie Bonifant both touched the ball on the very first snap of Lamar Jackson's career in that game in the uh, Georgia Dome against Auburn that year. And it was an interception. It was an interception. I was I was leaving that part out, Eric, but I understand. <laughs> hey, third and five coming up after the incomplete pass. I just thought it was interesting that Jackson came in with so much hype, and yet the start was fairly inauspicious, if you will. Yeah, no kidding. And, and 
Uh, I think the, the finish was so emphatic that it has propelled him to the success that he's having here uh, or in the NFL currently. Uh, I don't know who else is in who else is above him in the MVP race as Miami has a third and five. Yep, Kane's on the year 27 percent. 31% against the ACC and they're 0 for 4 today. Williams trying to pick up this five from the pocket. And it's caught. That's Mallory, the tight end, who has come up huge now. Not only last week against Florida International, but he's off to a great start here today for the Kings. Well, he beats Marquise Waters off the line of scrimmage, makes a move at the top of his route. The throw gets by the fingertips of Waters. And Mallory with a big first down conversion. It's a really nice job of Jaron Williams as well. Moving around in the pocket to really create some space and be able to deliver that ball. Got to like the way that he has settled down here lately. And how about the protection from the offensive line? Three to four seconds. This is an offensive line that struggled so bad to start the season. And Dan Enos complimented him, said they are getting better and better as this season goes on. And we saw the fruits of it right there. Robert Burns, the 225-pound sophomore from Gulliver Prep in Miami. Bangs away for a couple of yards after another big catch by Will Mallory. And, and talking about the offensive line, Eric, how often do you see an offensive line that has as many consecutive starts as this one? After that first game against Florida, they made the switch, taking John Campbell out, putting Ja'Kai Clark in, and they started the same group since. Yeah, absolutely. And that continuity is paying off for them, and it allows your group to grow together and just keep improving as the season goes on, which we are seeing. This team was on a record setting pace for Miami, giving up sacks. In the last four games, Pittsburgh was leading the country in sacks. They held them to two. They hold uh, Louisville to one, FIU to one, and Florida State got two. Tremendous improvement from that group. And how about John Campbell in this game? Filling in for Donaldson, a guy who gets benched early in the year, and John Campbell with a great block earlier on the touchdown play. Yep. Now third and long for Jaron Williams in Miami. The third, guy that, eight, third and eight, third and seven and a half, Roddy from the midfield line. The guy that he's like to go to, Will Mallory, right there to the top of the screen with a tight split with KJ Osborne. And we're going to be interesting. Alabama taking the lead after Auburn led early. See how the Crimson Tide performs with Mac Jones at quarterback. Boy, that was very, very political on your part. Here is Williams. On the third down play, Osborne the catch. He's going to be short, so fourth and a yard and a marker down. Well, it's in the range of where you'd get a defensive holding. Yep. Holding. Defense, number 10. 10 yard penalty, first down. Marcus Waters, the junior from Delray Beach, Florida. And, and, and when we talked to the Duke coaches yesterday, they said Waters is the guy that they want matched up against these tight ends, whether it's Brevin Jordan, who we thought was going to play, haven't seen a lot of him, yep. or Will Mallory, another guy who's really talented. He's going to draw that matchup a ton today, and Mallory has gotten the better of him a couple of times here early. Yeah. Quite a task that Matt Guerrero, the defensive coordinator, one of the real rising stars in coaching, has put on Marquise Waters today to handle the tight ends for Miami in their throw game. Here's Williams gunning downfield and overshoots Thomas. Junior from East St. Louis, Jeff Thomas. 31 catches, three scores on the year. That time it got behind Blackwell. It's the most explosive of these Miami receivers. You just haven't seen the consistency really throughout his career for Jeff Thomas. But Jaron Williams there taking a shot. I like that. You know, you're going to get press coverage. Got to go downfield every once in a while. Williams, who's second in the ACC at 64.8% completion, is just five of his first 12 here in the rain today for 59 yards. And pass number 13, he's looking for Osborne and overthrows him incomplete. Alexander and Blackwell. Drop back for Duke. And the Duke defensive backs were actually a little mixed up on that. And I believe Jared Williams was too. It looked like he expected KJ Osborne to keep going towards the end zone. And Osborne broke it like it was a post. But the Duke defensive backs were a little turned around. There was some separation. But likely the, the Duke defensive backs saw what Jared Williams saw. So now third in the full 10. Harris in the backfield. Also, Michael Irvin has come in as the tight end on the bottom of your screen. Here's Williams 
Trying to make something happen, and he'll be sacked, and that's Kwanzaa. Roddy, Eric, you guys love Kobe Kwanzaa, don't you? It, it, it's senior day, and on senior day, you want to make those impactful plays. You see the C on his chest. Kwanzaa was lined up right over the center, is able to fight through between the center and the guard on the A back, or in the A gap. But great coverage down the field. It was man to man, and there was nobody open. You had Shaka Hayward on the back, and you saw the coverage on the outside on Wiggins as well. Lou Headley, uh oh, look out. Straight up the chimney, and it will bounce around back just beyond the Blue Devil 20 to the 21 where Jimmy Murphy touches it up. Three point lead for Duke. And passionate fans like these by awarding the Lip Moss Student Section of the Year. Duke Blue Devils already on the national watch list. Go to ESPN.com slash Taco Bell to see how your school can compete or get the committee's attention by using hashtag Lip Moss Student Section Contest. Blue Devils from their 21. And a quick throw to Bracey. Really like the way Duke used Quentin Harris' legs, his ability to run the last time they were out on that drive. Ran well. See how much they do over here. A little toss to the boundary. Mateo Durant, maybe a yard or so. Roddy, Eric, there are a couple things that come to mind here with the tempo. We saw Duke get in the tempo a lot, resulting in the Harris touchdown run. You guys think they can trap Miami defensively here with this tempo? And they, Duke's got a lot they can do from a package standpoint, Roddy. They absolutely do. Right now, they're motioning Noah Gray across. And here goes Durant, first down. Out to the 38. Ten-yard run. One of the things they can do is start Noah Gray, detach from the formation, bring him in as an H-back, gets a nice block on the edge, and Durant able to pick up the first down. Another thing the tempo can do as well is trap one personnel group on the field for Miami. Miami is extremely deep across the defensive line. They have a backup, number 94, Trevon Hill. He's going to the senior bowl. Uh, number 71, Scott Patchen. He started earlier in the year. Well, you get one group on the field, and you don't let their depth come to fruition and hurt you. Here is Durant tripped up from behind at the 20-yard line. Tackle was made by Hill who came from the front, got all the way downfield. But look at the hole that's opened up, and again, one-on-one -on -one with the safety. Gervin Hall not able to come down with it. And let me tell you, Mateo Durant's not going to live down the fact that a defensive end just ran him down. About the athleticism from Travon Hill, able to get prevent the touchdown. But again, Duke able to gash Miami up the middle in a situation, man-to-man -man coverage, safety in the middle of the field, not able to come up with the tackle. Career best run for Durant of 42 yards. We've got an injured Miami player on the field, and it's Michael Pinckney who's been shaken up. And the young man from Jacksonville who played at Reigns on the first coast. And boy, this would be a big loss here because this is some kind of productive player. He's been an incredible leader for this Miami team. You're going to see him right here. There's Pinkney, 56. You see him on the edge. Look like just the step that he took. Mm. Brought his foot up out the ground, went down, and see how he's able to manage getting off the field. So Pinkney, we saw Navon Donaldson leave earlier, the offensive line. And this this is a is a big injury for a number of reasons, but but one of them is Zach McLeod, a linebacker who came in with Shaq Quarterman and Michael Pinkney, started as a freshman, decided that he wanted to redshirt this season because of the fact that Miami's had to play so much nickel that there's only two linebackers on the field and it was going to be Pinkney and Quarterman. But McLeod has played in four games this year. So yep. if he were to play in another one, would not be able to come back next year. So you have to go to someone else, likely Ryan Ragone coming in to replace Pinkney. I think they plugged Sam Brooks, a true freshman mm. from Northwestern High School in here, at least for this snap. And Durant, another run, patch in the tackle. I like Duke, Duke 
and the rhythm they've gotten running the football. Again, we talked about Quentin Harris, but the big run from Mateo Durant go right back to it. Yep. That's Gray working toward the formation. Second down, Harris wants to throw. Loops one toward Young, and too strong out of bounds. Blades was there with Aaron Young. Young comes in with 27 catches and three scores this year for the Blue Devils from Marita, California. He's a big target, six foot four. Yep. They're trying to throw the jump ball. Fifth year Not guy. Not able to keep for, it in bounds. Yep. Fifth year guy for David Cutcliffe. So here is third down and the full eight. Now they're going to take the shot for Gray, and that's too strong. Knowles was there. And they're going to bring on Reed to see if he can add to the advantage here. And Noah Gray was not able to keep that route as high as Quentin Harris anticipated because Knowles kind of sat on the route and pushed him a little bit as he was coming out of his break. The route ends up a little bit more flat than Quentin Harris expected, and it ends up in an overthrow. So the eighth play of the drive will be a 36-yard try for Reed. Center of the field. And the kick is good for A.J. Reed. He's two for three. The Blue Devil lead has grown to six as we check with Kevin Connors. All right, West's uh, studio update. Baylor will play Oklahoma in the Big 12 title game next week. The Bears all over Kansas right now. Jermichael Hasty a touchdown run. Jerry Bohannon has one as well. 24-0, now 31-0 Baylor on top. Meantime, where does Alabama fit in the playoff discussion? Najee Harris touchdown run. 10-7, they lead Auburn. Back to West Roddy and Buffalo Bills great Eric Wood. Oh, well done by the former Ithaca bomber, Kevin Connors. There you go. Tossing it to you. We can find Bills Mafia anywhere for you, you would. Hey, I love it. Appreciate that shout out. <laughs> Forgot to say Pro Bowler and Louisville Hall of Famer. That's it, yeah. Well. We'll just get the rest of the credential list poured out there for you. All right, now let's start firing insults. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable now. Hey. hey, but how about the Buffalo Bills? How about that win on Thursday? You know, they don't get a whole lot of primetime games for, for them to make a statement like that on Thanksgiving. That's a pretty special deal for them. And it coincides with you joining John Murphy in the booth. I wonder how all this has come together so quickly, Roddy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure the guys on the team that are putting their blood, sweat, and tears on the line each week love that their former center in the radio booth yeah. is taking credit for the success no, no, this year. No, 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 no. Just, you're right. Big win. Absolutely. Absolute big win over Dallas. Well, A.J. Reed is two for three on field goals. The Harris touchdown to six point Blue Devil lead. And here is Thomas on the kick return, and he'll be stopped shy of the 25. And week 13 means Monday night football. And this week, the crew is in the great outdoors of the Pacific Northwest. The Vikings meet Russell Wilson and the Seahawks. Minnesota in off a bye after winning two straight. Seattle's posted four straight wins. Eight Eastern, five Pacific on ESPN, ESPN Deportes, and ESPN app. And Monday night countdown starts our coverage at six. Seahawks have been sneaky good. Yeah, they have. Out in the NFC West. San Francisco getting a lot of the headlines, and rightly so, but Seahawks are right there for Pete Carroll as Cameron Harris. Picks up almost seven on first down. Tackle made by Shaka Hayward, the freshman. And we've got another injured Miami player. Looks like another one of those guys on the offensive line. Oh, it's Scaife. So DJ Scaife shaking up. With just under seven minutes to go here in this second period of play. And this would be a big loss if he could not come back into the game because they're already down Donaldson. And a lot of times, you know, Donaldson uh, with John Campbell coming in, a lot of times your 6 0 lineman, he would be the guy that would come in whether a guard or tackle goes down. I believe he was the backup right tackle as well. And so this would be a big loss for the Hurricanes, likely making it extremely tough up front. We talked about how improved their offensive line has been throughout this season, turning into one of their strong points to close out this season. Well, two injuries for an offensive line is so tough to overcome. And Campbell started the season as the right tackle, started that, that Florida game. At right tackle, they had to shuffle after Florida was able to get after him to the tune of 10 sacks. One of those fixes was moving Scaife out, inserting Ja'Kai Clark in. So we'll see what the shuffle does to this offensive line now. 
Eric, that's the second time, and I know it's just a part of the deal, but the second time we've seen a Miami offensive lineman get rolled up. And Wes, it looks like they've moved Kylie on Herbert to right tackle. Here's Harris going left away from the inserted new tackle. It'll be third and short. Waters the stop from the 3 3 5 set that Duke runs. Waters, by the way, is the uh, bandit, the strike, and the razor are the other two safeties. It's intimidating. Three safety look. Yeah, I kind of like the names, to be honest with you. With the injuries on the offensive line, though, obviously in a third and short, you'd expect Miami to just run it. But how does this affect the play calling of Dan Enos down the stretch? Because this is a Duke team that can get after the quarterback with talent up front. Got a hand to Harris. He'll try and slip outside, cuts it back, and finds room. First down of the 43. Mike Harley did a really nice job, number three, for Miami here, I think, creating a path. Absolutely gets the block right there on Michael Carter to create a wider lane. You know, you, a lot of times you just ask those those wide receivers for a stalemate. That time, Harley was able to push out Carter and be an addition to the run game. So Harris walks off, limping a little bit. We'll keep an eye on Harris. And Robert Burns comes in the ball game. Four carries, 31 yards last Saturday against Florida International. Williams got. Cuts it loose early, and the traffic doesn't clear for Osborne, I don't think, because Derek Tangelo got out in space pretty quick for Duke. Really good identification of the screen by Tangelo. He's able to retrace where he came from, because Osborne had a cutback, but it was quickly closed down by Tangelo. Right there, I saw Edgar Serenord a second ago. He was out there, too, the big fellas. Yep. I think one of the reasons Matt Guerrero is excited about his defense Next year is the return of a guy like Tangelo along with Dima Cagey. You do lose some guys with experience, but we bring back a lot of guys that are very talented with a lot of football in their holster. Williams tried to get it to Mallory, couldn't hang on, would have been short of the first down. So it's going to be third and about 11 here as Hornbuckle was up in the pocket pressuring Jaron Williams. And the question on this third down, on third and long, is does Matt Guerrero, the Duke defensive coordinator, heat up the pocket? You've got a backup at left tackle. You've got a, a backup at right tackle. So how aggressive are you going to be in this situation? Excuse me, backup at left guard right. and right tackle. By the way, Jaron Williams started the game four for eight. He's two for seven cents. And this is third and 11 with under five to go in the first half. Look at all the guys Duke has close to the line of scrimmage. Williams in the pocket. Mallory, a back shoulder catch. First down and more. Mallory to the Blue Devil 26-yard line. You cannot say enough about the job that Jaron Williams does here. He's got a free hitter right up the middle, able to dodge, and the pocket's not always perfect for a quarterback. Able to get it to Mallory, and then Mallory does the rest after the catch. Will Mallory has is an emerging, emerging star for this Miami offense. With Brevin Jordan out, you needed that position to step up, and Mallory is showing what made them so excited in the preseason about his prospects. Four for 71 last week. You see three for 68 so far, and a big one there. Of 32 yards, and here is Burns leaning forward for five on first down. We're going to see how big that play was, but for the moment, Roddy, it is a huge play for Manny Diaz in Miami, and another lineman is shaken up for the Canes. Boy, this is the third different lineman to go down in this first half for Miami. Yeah, just based who the guys are they're standing up. I, I think it's John Campbell, number right. 74. Well, Donaldson came out, Campbell came in, and oh. It's the third time we've seen one of these Miami offensive linemen get rolled up. And there's a legitimate question on if they have enough offensive line bodies here to continue to roll these guys in mm -hmm. at this pace. Mm. It's one of the dangers of being in the trenches. Is hey, Eric, you know well. I absolutely do. I had six lower body surgeries while playing NFL football and playing offensive line. But in the interior where John Campbell was, especially on a day like this where it's rainy, it's a natural grass field. There's bodies all over. There you see a defensive lineman hitting the deck. He falls right on his ankle. Likely, I don't want to speculate, but, you know, that, that looked more serious um, 
than you'd hope it would be as you see him getting helped up not really putting any pressure on that ankle and you really feel for John Campbell getting a chance in this game to fill in get back in the lineup a guy who you mentioned started the season uh, a true freshman let's check in with the studio Hi, right, Wes, a wrinkle to the Iron Bowl. Alabama, of course, without Tua. Mac Jones had played well, but intercepted here by Smoke Monday, and he's going to bring it back 30 yards on the pick six. Auburn the 17-10 lead, but on the ensuing kickoff, one of the many playmakers Alabama has. Look at Jalen Waddle weave in and out, and then turn on the afterburners. Bama up, now tied, 17-7. Wes? All right, Kevin, thanks. D.J. Scaife came back to fill the spot of Campbell. As you see, Robert Burns try to get to the edge, and Manny Diaz has got to check his depth chart here, Roddy. Yeah, he absolutely does. And, and Danny Enos is going to have to figure out some creative ways for these backups not to put too much pressure on him. This is a Duke team that's going to put a lot of people around the line of scrimmage. They're going to move a ton, and they're going to send blitzes from all over the place. So what is Dan Enos' call here on third and three? Yep. Just ahead of three minutes to go in this first half. Burns tries to pick up the first and does to the 15. But Robert Burns only had 10 carries on the season coming into the night. Had four of them last week in the loss to Florida International. And so far, he's been up to the task of spelling Cameron Harris here this evening. Tenth play of the drive coming up. He's Robert Burns, the good talent to play. When we asked these Duke coaches about the Miami <laughs> running backs, great. they kind of looked at us like, these are Miami running backs. They're yeah. all really good. Doesn't matter who we see. And timeout. A timeout Duke. has been taken Their by the Blue Devils yeah. here. And so a 30 second timeout for David Cutcliffe. And I'm sure his coordinator, Matt Guerreri, wants to get on the headphone here. And Discuss what we have with first and ten coming up with Miami and the ball trailing by six. Don't forget NFL primetime with Chris Berman, Tom Jackson premieres tomorrow night, 7:30 Eastern only on ESPN Plus. Nobody takes you through all the highlights and breaks down every game like they do. Streaming each week so you can watch anytime you want, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday on any device you choose to get ESPN Plus. Download the app or go to ESPNPlus.com. That is the Tom Jackson from. Louisville. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that one was going to be. Oh, was, that was a that was a layup for you. That was a layup for you. That was, was a layup. John Murphy loves when I throw those in our radio broadcast every does, week. When it's yeah. a, especially through the preseason when it was a third string tight end from some random team. He loved when I do that. By the way, uh, tough day for the Cards. Tough day for the Cards in the rivalry game uh, against Kentucky. A really rainy a day led to a bunch of missed tackles. Something we're seeing in this game as well. As the ball carriers get slick, it could be tough to bring them down at times. Williams dialing Mallory, who was there hand fighting with Waters. I think the Canes might have wanted a marker thrown, didn't get it. Second and ten coming up. Well, it, it, and there was, Waters with the hands behind the back as he <laughs> trots back to the huddle. They certainly were not behind the back during the coverage, but there was hand <laughs> fighting on both sides. I liked the no call. Also, that ball was way out of bounds, so uh, I, I, I would, I would have deemed it uncatchable as well. But they tried to get Mallory on a wheel after faking the tunnel screen. Yep. Michael Irvin, the tight end. Mallory, the tight end, right. And a pair of receivers now. The running back stays Burns here for Williams. And here's Miami looking to throw. They dump it to Burns with a screen. And Burns scores. K.J. Osborne, I think, cracked the door open just enough for Burns to go diving through. Well, it's a fantastic call by Dan Enos. You've got backups in on your offensive line. So instead of asking them to hold up in the pass game, you have a fake tunnel wheel down the sideline that you miss an easy job of protection against them and then you follow that up with a screen pass where they block for one two counts get out in the open field and burns is able to get in the end zone 11 plays 76 yards and under five minutes for the robert burns touchdown catch and miami's in front of point let's check with the studio and here's kevin and West coming up on the Army National Guard halftime report. Much more on the convincing win for Ohio State today over Michigan and what it could mean for Jim Harbaugh. Plus, we'll check in again on the Iron Bowl 
and have updates of all the college football action. Big one involving Baylor as well. Coming up, when you join me, Coach Jim Mora and Emmanuel Acho on the Army National Guard halftime report. Wes? All right. Kevin, thanks very much. Two and change to go here at Wallace Wade Stadium on a rainy night on the West Campus in Durham. Miami has now outscored its opponents 100 to 45 in the second quarter this year. That 45, Roddy, is only 16% of the points the entire season that the defense has allowed. So mark down the 10 points that Duke has scored as an anomaly in terms of what Miami's done. Well, it's been a complete departure from what we saw earlier in this game. The offense has really struggled to start moving the ball, getting any points on the scoreboard since then. Even through the injuries, Miami's offense has picked up a little bit since that fake punt. And Duke's offense has started to get something going as well. One point lead for the Canes. Two timeouts left for both schools. The Blue Devils return it with Javon Jackson. And he'll reach about the 23-yard line. Another look at the touchdown pass. And you see Robert Burns able to get out. Look at K.J. Osborne out front and big Ja'Kai Clark. He doesn't put his hands on anybody, but just the safety blanket of running into the end zone with your offensive lineman in front. Feels good for a running back, but a fantastic block by K.J. Osborne. You talk about the leadership that he provides earlier. He's done it blocking. He's done it in the receiving game as well over the course of the year. Sprung it. Sprung Robert Burns right there. So Duke's going to go three wides and a tight end in the package here, along with Deion Jackson. And Harris going to keep it. Blue Devils have two timeouts and a yard for Quentin Harris. That'll get Duke in this second quarter to about two minutes to go. What will be interesting to see is number one how fast Duke goes and number two what Miami decides to do with these timeouts particularly if they get a stop here. Yep. Second down and nine. Noah Gray the catch shy of the first down to the 32 no timeout at least for the moment from Manny Diaz. And I think that's because Duke decided to go so fast to get there on second down. Second catch of the game for Gray and the third down stop. And now Manny Diaz the timeout because Rousseau circled around and got Deion Jackson to the ground. 30 second timeout. And Wes, these Duke coaches told us that tempo was going to be a big part of what they did, but they got up to run these second and third down plays so quickly. It wasn't a whole lot of time taken off the clock. A really nice job of Jonathan Ford in the middle, just clogging things up. And then yeah. Greg Rousseau comes to finish the playoff. But Manny Diaz only has to burn one time out, and his offense is going to get the ball back well, with a minute, with a minute, a minute 30 left. Yeah. Well, less than a minute has come off. Yeah, exactly. But because Duke, after the first down play, yeah. lines up so quickly and runs the second down play. So I think what I would have liked to have seen is Duke waste a little more time before that second down play. Okay. Either draw the Miami timeout or at least get another 20, 15 to 20 seconds off the clock. Roddy, when you're fighting it though offensively, and let's be honest, the Blue Devils get the touchdown from Harris. That's their third touchdown the last, well, when we finish this, 12 quarters of play. Yeah, and, and, and maybe they feel like, they likely feel like that gives them the best chance. Sure. It locks Miami in. They're able to, to simplify what Quentin Harris is going to see. But it ends up costing them here because they're going to have to punt the ball away to Miami offense. It started to get a little momentum. Now, Dave Cutcliffe likely thinks, hey, my defense is going up against three backup offensive linemen. Maybe we can go ahead and stop them, even if we're in a situation where we give them the ball back with a lot of time. And we can go for it. Oh, there you go. Wow. Interesting. Wouldn't be surprised here to see them try and get them offsides with a snap count and then take a timeout themselves. And there's the timeout. Timeout. Dude. Well, their second of the half. So Duke Burns, second timeout. Timeout number two here with 100 seconds to go in this first half. And you know the Blue Devils. There's the snap, and Parker drives it over the top of Osborne. 
into the 15. Here's KJ trying to make some moves. Wow, look at this. Now trying to get to the backside where he's got some teammates. And he kicked the ball. The ball got stripped out and it got kicked out of bounds. They'll spot it at the 21. I'm not quite sure how this got knocked loose here. Well, it was one heck of a roller coaster. It makes the first guy miss, and now <laughs> you'd like to see him get upfield. Decides to try and get outside. He's actually got blockers in front. It's a really nice job on the perimeter out there. Trayvon McSwain. Trayvon McSwain <laughs> punching that ball out. And a lot of times you see those guys on the shield in the back not have to make a tackle. When they get in the open field, they kind of freak out a little bit. Those guys playing in space, but McSwain gets a big paw on the ball, knocks it out. And you could say Osborne had the ball and the carrying it in the wrong hand, but when you cut back that many times, it's hard to remember which way. <laughs> you know, point. you're heading towards the sideline to keep that ball in your left hand there to prevent that. One timeout left for each school. Williams eludes the rush. Mallory, another huge catch. Out to the 49 goes Will Mallory. Singleton flipped him over. It's hard to cover for that long. Jaron Williams has done a fantastic job today so far of buying time in the pocket and avoiding the rush. Quick snap, 1-11 to go. Here's Williams in trouble and sacked. Chris Rumpf. Number 96, Chris Rumpf is giving Herbert uh, the... Miami. He is giving him the he's giving him the business over there. That is a tough matchup. Chris Rumpf was a freshman All-American last year. Comes into the game with uh, one and a half sacks last week, three on the season, and he beat him the last two plays. The first play on the long pass to Mallory, Williams able to avoid the rush this time, nowhere for Williams to go. Mm. That was a really nice job, as you said, Eric. And look on the play before, it's Chris Rumpf in the backfield that wasn't able to get Jaron Williams. And Mallory has done a really nice job in that matchup against Marcus Waters of winning in one-on-one -on -one coverage. He's the guy who's consistently done it. He's got four catches for 93 yards, does Will Mallory, the sophomore from Providence in Jacksonville, Florida, who had four for 71 last week. Now, we saw, according to the folks keeping the stats, Brevin Jordan started the game and played the first snap. Yep. Beyond that, I don't think we've laid eyes on Brevin Jordan in the 11 for Miami on offense. Well, to be honest with you, it's, it's likely one of those situations where Jordan comes out, doesn't feel great. Mallory gives him the better chance because you're going to have these situations where you have to win. You don't want a guy that's hobbled. And Mallory has done a fantastic job of winning. So now second down after the rump sack. Miami is out of timeouts with 66 seconds to go in this first half and a one-point lead. Williams on a straight drop in trouble again and will be sacked. This time, Ben Fry got around there, as did Trey Hornbuckle. Fourth time they've gotten to Williams in the opening frame. Well, we haven't seen Victor DiMicheggi in a while, but Hornbuckle just going right inside Zion Nelson. He meets Fry there in the backfield, and that sack's likely going to end any chances that Miami had of getting points before the half. Miami just letting the play clock roll down here for third and long. And Burns. And there's the last time out for David Cutcliffe with 16 seconds left. So a little game management really both ways there. Manny Diaz let the play clock go down. And now David Cutcliffe will use his last time out the Canes will punt it. Well, it's a wet day, Wes, and, and so you want to make Miami have to handle this punt and be able to get it away. It, it's, it is about being able to get to the punt and block it, which they almost certainly will try and do, but it's also about forcing Miami on a day where this is not a gimme. Right. We've already seen a high snap, forcing them to field the snap, be able to get the punt away. Well, these two teams kind of stumbled and staggered a little bit early in the game and now seemingly both sides have picked up a little rhythm here in this second period yeah, and I think we, we saw the offenses certainly struggle but each of them found their footing for Miami it's been going to Will Mallory which they've done consistently the issue is is Jaron Williams going to continue to be able to avoid pressure in the pocket because it doesn't look like that's going to end with the injuries that Miami's had up front yeah seven possessions for Diaz's team five punts two touchdowns 
Cameron Harris, a touchdown run, and then a moment ago, Williams to Robert Burns, 15 yards for the score. But Duke out of timeouts and 16 seconds left. And Miles Hudzik will wait on Lou Headley to punt. You got to think you call the timeout in that situation to go after this punt and go for the block. Mm. Blue Devils don't get there. Headley going to hang it up. Clock at 10 and it rolls out of bounds with eight. So the Blue Devils who started out with a missed field goal in their first three possessions sandwiched by two punts and then you see the scoring Reed hit two field goals squeezed around the touchdown run by Quentin Harris and a punt a moment ago and they've likely got one maybe two plays in the in the pocket here with eight seconds left or take a knee and head to the house and the, and the fact that Duke has four drives over seven plays is a good sign for this offense that struggled on third downs this year. So they will take the knee. The Canes will have a one point lead and the football when we go to half two. Duke is eight and 63 when trailing at the half and winless in seven games with David Cutcliffe this year. Army National Guard halftime report next. Here's our feature for Duke more in a Jiffy brought to you by Jiffy Loop, second big ball game for Will Mallory. We knew that Duke was going to come out and play man to man consistently, and the question was who was going to cover the tight end. Marquise Waters has gotten that a lot, and Will Mallory has been able to win. Jaron Williams has made some people miss in the backfield to create some time, and it's been the big tight end that's been his favorite target. He has been all over the field for this Miami offense, creating big plays, extending drives, and you see it there, career high 93 yards in the first half. He is uh, four catches of the seven targets for Mallory. And Miami, with the advantage, gets the ball to start the second half with Osborne and Thomas waiting on the kick. And it will be handled by Jeff Thomas. Look out. Got to the 25 and got banged around by Damon Filial Johnson. Let's check with Eric Wood. I talked to Coach Cutliff coming out of the half, and he said offensively they want to continue their tempo. He thinks it's giving Miami fits, but they got to capitalize on some of their plays down the field. Feels like they left some points on the board defensively. They need to get pressure on Williams, and then obviously they need to do a better job of covering Mallory. He said Williams is looking for Mallory on almost every single play. We've got to keep an eye on this Miami offensive line that's been banged up as well through the opening. 30 minutes of play. Robert Burns starts the second half at running back. We saw Cameron Harris leave the game not long after a touchdown. He has not come back. And we'll check this line here. It looks like Ja'Kai Clark's moved over to left guard. You see Zion Nelson. Corey Gaynor's the center. And they have plugged in Leon Herbert yeah, at the right Long. guard spot. And is that Skate that's come back at right tackle? It is, and I believe they decided to move Herbert inside the guard after his struggles against Rump on the last drive before the half for Miami. There's a throw to the far side. Mark Pope was the intended receiver in front of Blackwell. So there is Scaife, who's got 19 starts, and I only bring that up because Roddy Eric, he's the most veteran piece they've got right now up front. He, he certainly is, and with the injuries it's going to be up to he and Gaynor to calm these guys down so they can perform against the Duke front that is active and been able to get in the backfield against Jaron Williams the question for Miami is where is Will Mallory he's right there let's we'll see if his big day continues third down here's Williams and Mallory couldn't hang on juggled it in front of Waters so the Canes will give the ball back as they go to four of 11 on third down. But, but once again, Mallory's open. And, and Jaron Williams does a good job of delivering the ball. Mallory just not able to come up with the catch, but that's a matchup that if I'm Miami, I'm going back to until Duke changes what they're doing. Lou Headley to punt. And we'll drive it away. And hang it high for Hudson, who makes the fair catch at the 31 yard line. So early stages here of period three. Duke at 
four and seven. Miami at six and five, eligible for postseason. Now, if we get to a point, Roddy and Eric, where there are not enough teams to fill the bowl card, Duke with a win would go to five and seven. And because of their outstanding academic performance ranking, Duke would be one of the first teams potentially of the five and seven list that might be extended a postseason invitation. David Cutcliffe not counting on that yesterday in our visit with him, but he did note, hey, look, we may be on that list, but it looks like the math might not work for five and seven teams, and that ball for Jackson is incomplete. So second and ten coming up for the Blue Devils. So for all intents and purposes, this is the final go for Quentin Harris out of Wilton, Connecticut, and a group of seniors that a year ago did get due to a bowl game, although that was Daniel Jones, the first-round pick of the Giants, who was their quarterback that day. Ball at the 31 for the Blue Devils, second and the 10. And it almost is picked by Trajan Bandy. After Boy. running the ball for over 100 yards in the first half, Duke decides to go with back-to-back -back passes to start this drive, both incomplete. And this is tremendous break on the football from tremendous uh, for Trajan Bandy. Well, yeah. if, if Quentin Harris throws that ball right away, he's got the throw, but hesitated, and Bandy's able to get there. They'll throw here on third and ten with a pocket collapsing, and Rousseau is the benefactor of the good pursuit that Miami had from Trayvon Hill. Interesting sequence, Eric. As you said, those two passes creates a third and long, and once again, Monk just not able to to keep Rousseau from getting in the backfield. I actually don't mind the original call, the first down call to try and hit Deion Jackson up the seam. You have that throw, but you got to be able to complete it. But going back to back passes gets you in third and long, and Rousseau is able to get the sack. And Miami gets a sack there with a three man pass rush, but there's arguably, arguably not three better pass rushers in the conference that could line up on the same D line in Hill, Garvin, and Rousseau. Osborne. Working to the backside on the punt return and will be helped out of bounds inside the 35. One point lead for Miami. They swap three and outs to start half two. That's um, the things that good football teams do, uh, we could not do. That's Manny Diaz after last Saturday night's loss at Marlins Park to the Golden Panthers of Florida International. As you see Robert Burns go to work. And Roddy, there's no two ways to get around it. I mean, it was a game that Miami looked lethargic at times, didn't play very sharp. Attention to detail wasn't great. I mean, it's a tough night. And, it, and it's not just the fact that they were favored by so much. It's the fact that you lose to a team that's in your city. Right. It's the fact that you lose to a coach who was the former coach who allegedly wanted that job. All of those guys on FIU's team wanted to play for you. Oh, look out. Big lick, ball loose. And let's see who's recovered it. Williams took a huge blast from Chris Rump. Well, with Dima KG out, it's been a number of guys who have gotten the pressure. We've seen Hornbuckle in the backfield, Tangelo in the backfield. This time it's Chris Rump who's able to beat the right tackle, DJ Scaife. And Miami's fortunate. That's a good job of Scaife after getting beat of chasing the play. Miami's fortunate to jump on that football because Rump able to create the disruption in the backfield. There are eight total sacks in the ballgame so far. And Jaron Williams has done a good job of avoiding a few more. Wow. Burns and a flag thrown. I think this might be up around the helmet too. Might be a face mask. Taj Rice the tackle. But Let's check the mark with uh, marker with Trey Blake, our referee. Personal foul, face mask, defense number 49. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Toby Kwanzaa with the face mask. It's frustrating. I mean, you, you can't really be too hard on Kobe Kwanzaa. He's trying to fight off a block. He gets his hand out there, and Burns' face mask is what he grabs. You'd hope that once he feels that it's face mask, you let it go before you yank, but that's a tough play for a linebacker to make, a guy that's fought all day. I, the replay, I think they've announced the wrong number. It was Rice that reached around okay. there. Yep. Not Kwanzaa, so. Nonetheless, first and 10 Miami at its 42 with a one-point lead. That's Michael Irvin, so a two-tight end set. Now flag and a delay a game. 
prior to the play clock expiring. Boy, Dan Time Enos out. is Miami, their first of the half. You see him there to the left. He's fired up about what happened on the operation of the snap. Down and 10, Williams in trouble. Sacked again, and that's Dylan Singleton coming from the secondary. Wes, we talked about the fact that they've had to shuffle on this offensive line due to injuries, and here you go with the long play action pass, a deep drop, and there's pressure coming from all over the place. Dylan Singleton has no nothing to take him away from rushing, rushes and is able to, to take down Jaron Williams. I, I just don't understand why you go to that at that point with a makeshift offensive line, patchwork offensive line, where you've already given up a strip sack earlier in the possession. And the guy on that play who was blocking Chris Rumpf was Michael Irvin, the tight end. That's a very tough matchup for him. And, and if, uh, if, if the DB doesn't get the sack there, Rump's gonna get him another one. Quick throw on the perimeter. Burns will be stopped by Hayward at the 40. Well, Shaka Hayward's played well in space today for the Blue Devils. We, we talked a little bit earlier about the reasons to be excited about this Duke team going uh, forward. 42, for 2020, absolutely. 42 Shaka Hayward is one of those reasons. We, we talked about Chris Rump who's only a redshirt sophomore, he'll be back, but, but Shaka Hayward looks the part. 6'4", 230, flies around the field, arrives with bad intentions. As, as you said, Wes, has done a great job in space here today. Got an older brother that played for Shannon Jarvis at Mill Creek High School outside of Atlanta, who is at Georgia State. Victor Hayward, who's an outstanding player. Here is Williams again, fleeing the pocket, and Jaron Williams will be taken out of bounds at the 45, and that's Hayward again. It was a little bit different coverage from Duke. It looked like they dedicated multiple defenders to Will Mallory to, this, to the tight end side of the field. Was able to take him away. Again, a little bit of pressure in the backfield flushes Jaron Williams. I like him making the decision quick to run, but a good stop by this Duke defense after the face mask extended the drive. Seven plays and now a punt for Miami. Still holding to this one point lead in the third. And the Aussie. Again, kicks one high, and it takes a Miami bounce. And Miles Hudson smart just to get away from it. So, Duke backed up, but they're into the field. Still down a point when we come back to Wallace Wade Stadium. A Sonic blockbuster season continues with the Big Ten ACC. Roddy Jones, Eric Wood, Chris Tamiani, our producer, Adam Brown, our director, West Durham at Wallace Wade Stadium. Miami a one-point lead. Duke backed up to start the drive. And here's Harris, the senior, stepping out of bounds after about a five-yard run. Well, Quentin Harris is a phenomenal young man. A fifth-year senior, Wilton, Connecticut. Not only outstanding quarterback, student-athlete, he is the epitome of the student-athlete, Roddy. Certainly is a guy who got his Duke degree, came back for a fifth year, is in the business school getting a, a, a master's as well. At a place like Duke, they don't just hand those out, Wes. Nope. You got to earn those. Absolutely. And he's trying to get his team back in front here in quarter number three. And that ball is thrown out of bounds. It looked like he wanted to try and find Jackson releasing from the backfield. So third and six coming up for the Blue Devils. The thing that Quentin Harris has done well today to keep this offense moving, he's used his legs, but more than that, he hadn't turned the ball over. That's turnovers have been a huge, huge downfall of his season this year. He's been really good taking care of the football so far. Yep. Came into the ball game, 15 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. In motion, Marwidi, the tight end. Harris loads, throws, and drops. Eli Panko could not pull that one in. Seen a couple of drops on this wet day. The rain is coming down about as hard as it has been, and Pankel had it right in the bread basket. Tries to catch it with his body, caress it in, just goes right between the arms, kind of like a punt that's coming down between the elbows. And Duke's gonna have to punt. I can second that from the sideline right now. It is absolutely <laughs> pouring down here. The hardest it's been coming down all day. It's going to be very tough uh, for the referees. They often try to drop the ball before each play. It's going to be harder and harder for them to keep that ball dry. Whoever can get the ground game going probably in the second half is going to be the most effective team. Well, here is Osborne trying to make something happen on the ground with the punt return. K.J. Osborne keeps his feet and breaks free inside the 20 and down to the 14. 
It looked like two or three different times they might have had a beat on him, but Osborne wouldn't have it. Well, K.J. Osborne has been right on the edge of this all day, searching for holes, searching for seems to be able to get into. This time he makes a couple of guys miss initially, cuts back, and then watch this. He shakes off an arm tackle, stiff arms a guy, is able to get past the punter. And if it wasn't for the stumble, he'd have had Shaka Hayward one-on-one -on -one with the race to the pylon. One of his longest punt returns of the year at 43 yards. Not his longest. He had a 52-yarder at home against Georgia Tech. And here is Burns back to work. On first and 10 at the 14 of Duke. And Waters makes the stop after a run of right at about five. You know, with, with the struggles that we just saw Duke catching the football, I, I would imagine that Miami takes the air out of the ball. They start handing the ball off, which actually might help them. You're not having the pass block. You're avoiding the sacks. Running the football is something that you have to do in these sort of conditions, and I think it could benefit Miami. Another give to Burns. And nothing there. Maybe a step, so it'll be third down. Roddy Eric, it's interesting. You start looking at Miami's run numbers. I mean, they come into the ball game at 123.9 during the regular season, 114.9 in league play. But you look at the number of times they run it in the ball game. Well, you're going to get those kind of numbers. They, they, they oftentimes skew pass far more than run. Yeah, they, they've run the ball the least number of times of any team in the ACC. And part of that's because of the pace. They're a huddle team, so they're slower than a lot of other teams. They just run less plays. But as a percentage of the plays they run, skews much more to the pass than, than you would expect. Toss, boundary side, and nothing. Johnson, the corner, got in there to Burns first. And then got some help from Singleton. Looks like Burns kind of fumbled it a little bit. It was on his back shoulder, but saw the nice job of setting the edge by Leonard Johnson. The guys to be able to rally and, and in situations like this, that's fine. Now, obviously, you like to, to score a touchdown, but being able to run the ball three times and the ability to kick the field goal, if you're able to get points out of it, you extend the lead. 27 yard try for Camden Price. His longest on the year, 32 against Florida State. And that kick is good. So Miami gets a great punt return from Osborne, but only three to show for it. In the rain in Durham, the Canes lead is four. Seventeen thirteen. Miami a four-point lead. Holy smokes, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a whole lot. Uh, there's a lot to be thankful for. Are those this, uh... shin guards, by the way. Oh no, those are those are yeah, yeah are. those are shin those guards. are catching shin guards. Catching, yeah, yeah, exactly. Look at that, huh? With all the are those are all the ACC yeah, team they helmets are the ACC on there. Helmets. That's pretty solid. Look at that. There. A lot went into that. Good for him. A lot of detail. Phil Yaw Johnson. Two returns last week at Wake to the 25. And that's where the Blue Devils start trailing by four with six minutes to go. Don't forget, tonight, 7 Eastern, 6 Central on ESPN and the ESPN app. Joe Burrow and number two LSU trying to stay perfect. Hosting Texas A&M and Death Valley. It was 74, 72 and seven overtimes. Our producer, Chris Damiani, tells me last year. Roddy, in fact, Damiani had a lot to do with the revamping of the overtime process, as I understand it. Harris going to be sacked on the play by Rousseau. <laughs> well, the, the big reason that this sack came is because there's nowhere to go with the football. Rousseau, though, able to use the power to push Jacob Monk into the backfield. He had to get the sack on Quentin Harris. Yep. Second and 11. And that's going nowhere. Deion Jackson, Rousseau is there, Neo Garvin is there, Pat Bethel back there. Wow. Well, it, it's you've got two players pulling on the side where John Garvin was coming from, and he just follows the pullers. There's nothing to keep him on the other side. He's able to tackle the ball in the backfield. Third down, 15. Harris trying to make something happen back to just beyond the original line. Michael Pinckney, by the way, shaking up in the first half, has come back here in half two. 
The team with Shaq Quarterman in the Miami linebacking core. There's Pinkney. I will say one thing with this rain coming down snapping the football can become an issue the center quarterback exchange and also on these long snaps these long snappers are often very sensitive to different conditions and, and, and the rain can often affect their snapping ability Ben Wyatt will handle it here to Austin Parker Miami has drawn in their perimeter defenders here Parker gets away a beauty. Osborne gonna let it hit. Watch this thing go. All the way back inside the five to the two. Phil Yaw Johnson will down it. Parker, who had a 72 yarder against Syracuse here, goes 71 there. Oh, that's flipping the field if I've ever seen it. So a flip of the field, and it's time for a look at our PlayStation player impact rating and Let's turn it up for Buholtz High School in Gainesville, Florida, and Chris Rump the second. Yeah, 91 on the player impact rating has had an incredible, incredible influence on games when he's been in there. Just a long defender, explosive defensive lineman, undersized, but you see him in here here in a run situation. And a handoff to Burns. Straight ahead for a couple. And on cue, he's able to make that play. He does great job with his long arms of creating extension off the line. The last time our crew called a game here, we had the Syracuse game and really held without any production. And coming into the game, we were extremely excited. The game before against Notre Dame, one of the best offensive lines in the country, he caused havoc. He uses a big arm over move, a big swim move that he's able to expose offensive linemen if they start lunging at him. Second down and eight. Miami content to run it on the first two plays here. So third down coming up. Eric, the scenario with kids like Rump and players like Rump who are long, lean, rangy is the term that gets thrown out there, Roddy, a lot. Are they difficult to handle based on and Rump lines up everywhere, as we found out a couple of weeks ago, and also studying some tape this week? Yes, they can definitely be hard to handle because it's not what you're used to. You're not used to blocking a guy that's 225 pounds. At times, when you look out on the field, he looks more like a receiver than a true defensive end. But when you get a guy like that, he, he possesses so much speed and quickness. And here it looks like they're going to have him lined off the ball. They're going to roam him around before the snap. Let him pick whatever mismatch he wants, and here he comes up the middle again. And they get a hit on Williams along with Hayward. Rump got in there. Williams is down in the end zone after taking a big lick, and Miami's going to go three and out. Well, well, Eric called it right up the middle. It was Chris, Chris Rump who gets matched up against the right guard. Looked like uh, Kylon Herbert that was there, and a couple of guys, Shaka Hayward, getting there yeah. as well. Chris Rump and Shaka Hayward teaming up to put a hit on Jaron Williams. And once again, it's Rump able to create some disruption in the backfield. So three and out go the Canes, who missed their last six third downs. The punt, and Hudzik will signal and make the fair catch at the Duke 49. Pretty good starting spot for the Blue Devils, who've had a hard time finding a rhythm offensively here in half, too. Well, you can go and thank Austin Parker for that field position. That booming punt completely changed what the field position game was in this. You're able to pin Miami back deep, get a stop, and now you're going to start just shy of enemy territory, just shy of Miami territory at your own 49. When you talk about the hidden yardage, and Dave Cutcliffe loves to talk about it, that's what he's talking about. Mateo Durant, who had 56 yards in the first half, Back here for half two is the running back and that throw by Quentin Harris offline for Jake Bobo with blades defending. And you can see the rain continues to fall here in Durham. Talk about a team in the college football playoff you need to have a look at. Keep an eye on number six Utah tonight against Colorado. Kyle oh, Whittingham got an interesting squad there, Roddy. Really good squad. Here is Durant, and he cannot shake Scott Patchett. So a loss of one on the play for Durant, third and 11 coming up. Well, you can almost feel the way this game is going, that it's going to come down to one of these special team plays to be able to, to move the ball and score. And the defensive line just dominating there on that run. Yep. Third and 11. In trouble, sacked. Ball loose. 
Was Harris called down? I think so. Jonathan Garvin into the backfield to get Quentin Harris on the ground. Fifth sack for Miami. Again, it's just a three-man rush. Both of the ends and Severa up the middle able to push the offensive lineman into the backfield. And that ball's out, Wes. If they review this, the question is, was there a clear recovery? Clearly there is. Number one, Nesta Jade Silvera able to jump on the football. It looked like that ball was out before Quentin Harris hit the ground. Look, ball out the right the there. Nothing's down. down. To losing possession. The previous play is under further review. So they're going to review this. Referee Trey Blake will go over on the headset upstairs. The replay official is Joe Ryder. Earlier in this half, talked about the fact that Quentin Harris had avoided the turnovers. 11 interceptions on the year, has also struggled with fumbles as well. And, and there's been many a time where he's been in the pocket, taking a hit, the ball has come out. You see, there's not a knee on the ground, ball is already coming out. That's going to be reversed. And then the other side of this is, is there a clear recovery? And the answer is an emphatic yes. You see number one, Nesta Jade Silvera, the defensive lineman, jump on the football. It's hard to miss a guy that big wearing number one, do anything, but certainly when there's a fumble and he jumps on it, you are going to notice. So Trey Blake, and they'll have to get the timing of this figured out along with a couple of other things if indeed it is ruled a fumble. Boy, how big has pressure been really for both schools here since halftime? And honestly, we knew that it was going to play a factor coming into this game. We saw these two teams struggle a week ago. Duke struggling with Boogie Basham at Wake Forest last week. Uh, Miami has struggled over the course of the season, and FIU was able to create some pressure. Yep. And we knew that once the injury started happening for Miami on offense, it could come into play, and it certainly has. Looks like the teams have gotten word. Miami's already jogged their offense onto the field before the official ruling has come down. Here's referee Blake. After further review, prior to the runner being down, he lost possession of the ball. And Miami recovered at the 40 yard line. It'll be first down for Miami at the 40 yard line. He needs to set the game clock to 215. 215 on the game clock. So the clock will be reset by 30 seconds. Silvera, the fumble recovery. Duke's 28th turnover of the year, Roddy. Their 14th fumble. They are now minus 12 in the turnover margin. Well, and for Miami, it's the 12th guy to wear the turnover chain this year. Seventh fumble of the year for Quentin Harris. And this now becomes about the line of scrimmage as you see Burns hit it for a yard, and Harris gets on the phone with the Duke coaches and that is one of the stats that has put Duke in this four and seven predicament with a quarter and less than two minutes to go. It certainly had Quentin Harris was going to be a guy coming into the season that was going to have to be just solid for this Duke offense. And he struggled at times throwing the ball. He struggled getting through reads and certainly struggled holding on to the football. I mean, we we've seen it in this league. Ryan Willis struggled with early at Virginia Tech. Yep. They eliminate that and you saw the run that they were able to go on. Quentin Harris has struggled on it with it the whole year. Wow, big collision off the left side. You see Singleton down in the box. Tangelo, Singleton there, Hornbuckle also involved. A couple of changes for the Blue Devils as Miami faces now third and eight. Thomas goes off. This is where, where you look for Mallory, isn't it? Absolutely. You have to find Will Mallory, and he's going to be to the bottom of your screen. The guy that's going to draw the the assignment is Marquise Waters. Marquise Waters. He's going to be in man-to-man -man coverage. And you also have Chris Rump right in the middle of your screen at linebacker level. And there's movement on Miami, I think. Snap perfection. Offense, number 65, five-yard penalty, third down. Redshirt sophomore gainer. Just feels like both of these offenses have been spinning their wheels in the mud, no pun intended, with what's going on with the, <laughs> with the, with the weather. But uh, if you're Miami, I don't think you feel comfortable with a straight drop back pass. Maybe you try and take advantage of Duke's aggressiveness with some sort of screen or draw. 
try and get him upfield and sneak in behind him. Here's the snap to Williams. He'll fire for the far side and overshoots the intended receiver, Mike Harley. So the ball overthrown of Harley, and now another three and out for Miami. But the field position game, Wes, yeah. now Miami's going to have an opportunity to pin Duke back deep when it was the complete opposite a possession ago before the fumble. Right. So I mean, this could be a huge possession just from that aspect because Duke hasn't been able to get anything going on offense. 11 total three and outs in the ball game, or 12 total three and outs in the game, six for Miami. Headley now to try and pin Duke. Angling away from Hudzik. And it will hit and get into the end zone. Might be a win for the Blue Devils. 16 seconds to go in the third. Let's check with Kevin. Hey, Wes, the Iron Bowl has had some incredible big plays. Mid-third, Alabama on the doorstep when Mac Jones is intercepted by Zacoby McLean. And on the six-year anniversary of the kick six, how about a 100-yard pick six? Longest ever interception return in Auburn history. And the Tigers have jumped in front 37-31 mid-third. Mm. Wow. <laughs> well, the question was, how was Mac Jones going to be able to perform? And under pressure in that situation, flipping it to Auburn, <laughs> wow. That game never disappoints. No. Durant from the 20 a yard. The full hundred. And, and Wes, when you talk about what Alabama needed to get in the college football playoff, to even be in the discussion, right? it was an emphatic win against an Auburn football team with a fantastic defense. They have a special teams touchdown today, but Mac Jones from the highlights has struggled. Yep. Go to the final quarter in Durham. In the rain, Miami of four portals go to work. Second down and nine off their own 21. Harris, flush from the pocket, overthrown into the Miami bench. Phil Yall Johnson closest out of there. Greg Rousseau was tracking the Blue Devil quarterback. Of course he was. That's what he's been doing the entire football game. And, and if I'm Quentin Harris in that situation, it's a wet ball. You're on the run, trying to fit it into a guy coming back to the sideline. I think you just take off and run and get as much as you can. Third down and nine. Straight drop, pressure, hit as he throws. And it's caught. Harris took a huge lick. And Harding makes a great catch. Miami's got Blades shaking up on the play along with Amari Carter. But Quentin Harris got blasted. This is what being quarterback is all about. You know you're going to take a hit, but you deliver the football and fitting it into a tight window. And we've seen some drops, and that thing's a duck coming out. But it gets to his intended receiver. What a job. All the way around by Quentin Harris, by Daryl Harding. You see the Miami players shaking up. Amari Carter. Now Blades as well. Yeah, Blades finally gets off the field. And Carter's kind of gotten in the catcher's crouch. For a moment, I thought he was. Headed off the field and then went back down in the catcher's crouch, but now he can jog it off. Looked like he had some words for that Duke sideline yeah, before he that. went back down too. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, that's Duke's first first down here in the second half on the Harding catch. And again, you, you have to commend Quentin Harris, knowing that he's going to take the hit, delivering the football, and being able to complete it. Blue Devils only had six yards in the third period, Roddy. Gray the tight end. First and ten. And Durant takes a big hit. And that was another hit by Trayvon Hill. We'll check with Kevin. Well, guys, Minnesota was stopped on fourth and goal, trying to rally from 14 points down. Wisconsin took the ensuing drive. 98 yards in six plays. Jonathan Taylor, the touchdown run to cap it off. The Big Ten West within their reach. Wes? Mm, Kevin, thanks. Here's Harris now, second and seven off balance throw, and another catch in traffic, and that's Harding again. And all of a sudden, 
sudden it's uh, Harris to Harding here. Well, Harding's gone without the gloves, and that seems to be the recipe. He's coming across the field on a little over route. <laughs> Bobbles it, but able to make the catch. Here's Harris keeping and cannot shake Shaq Quarterman and also Michael Pinkney. Yeah, these new gloves wide receivers wear nowadays, and, and even the offensive linemen, they get so much stick on them. But when this, when it's raining like this, sometimes you trust the natural feel of your hands, and that's exactly what they're doing on the outside for Duke now. Well, and Quentin Harris is going to get sacked back behind the first down mark. Hill, the grad transfer from Virginia Tech, battling through. Watch the get off by the two defensive ends. I mean, Hill. Looked like he was coming out of a track stance, and Michael Pinkney coming from the other side, able to be the one to wrap up Quentin Harris. So now third and 11. Beyond the reach of Gray, Bandy was there for Miami. Well, this was a pass that was going to Noah Gray no matter what. It was three verticals from the receivers just waiting on Noah Gray to get open on likely an option route. Decides to break out, bandy all over him, and an incomplete pass. So now, Osborne will stand at the 10 and wait on the punt of Parker. Nine plays for Duke in the possession. Boy, kicked a good wet football there. Osborne, the fair catch at the 14. Two minutes of change, gone in the fourth. Four point game in Durham. Four point lead for Miami. First and 10 for the Canes coming up. Off their 14 yard line with Roddy Jones, Eric Wood, West Durham here at Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham. Final Saturday of college football's regular season. We got ourselves one being played in pretty wet conditions, to be honest with you. It's been raining throughout the ball game. Williams wants to throw. Catch is made, and that's Mark Pope, who has his first catch in three and a half games in front of Josh Blackwell. If you're going to go the pass game, that's the way to do it. It's a timing route. It's just a five-yard stop route by Mark Pope. There's no chance of the defensive lineman being able to get to Jaron Williams after beating the block in front of him. You're able to create some separation because the ball is thrown when he's coming out of his break. Really nice completion. So second down and four. Williams trying to find a seam. Now flush from the pocket. And he'll just throw it away. Serenord. Fifth year senior from Miami, by the way. Big 92 for the Blue Devils was chasing Jaron Williams. And, and on back to back plays, we've seen the difference in the two pass games. The first one, you had a timing round. Three third, just a really a catch, rock, and throw on a five step hit, on a five yard hitch. That one, Jaron Williams is looking and having to read. And the, the defensive linemen are able to beat the offensive lineman's block, flush Jaron Williams from the pocket. And when you're in a situation like this where the ball's wet, once you get out of the pocket, it's kind of a free-for-all on what you're going to get yeah. when the ball comes out of the quarterback's hands. So here is third and four now. Williams wants to throw, and he'll be sacked, and it's rough. Seventh sack of the night for Duke, and that's a season high for David Cutcliffe's team. So the thing that Duke does a really good job of on this, Will Mallory has killed them all day, but look at him right here. Watch what happens when he tries to get off the line of scrimmage. He's collisioned by a defensive end. That was number 86, Drew Jordan, who doesn't let him get off the line. That's one way to help your defensive backs when you're struggling with the tight end. Collision him with the defensive end, make it tough for him to get off the line of scrimmage, and you're able to get the sack. Hillary was in playing the... Line spot and Rump was able to one step him, by the way, Roddy, on the way to the quarterback. And then not a great punt from Headley, so a plus field start for Duke. Blue Devils trail four. We're in the fourth in Durham. He's in the fans. So, how much does a bowl mean to Miami 
and a win tonight for that matter. I, I think more than the bowl, they just need the win. Honestly, get the taste out of your mouth of that FIU loss and what Manny Diaz called one of the lowest moments in program history. And on first down, it is Harris tackled by Garvin. Let's see if we get to the quarterback run game here a little bit. Yeah. Deion Jackson will get the rock this time, and Jackson into the Miami secondary for a first down. Robert Knowles the stop. It's been a while since we've seen Duke pop one of their runs. Yep, that time Deion Jackson finds a hole. It's a good job in the secondary bringing him down. Quick on the snap, nothing there on first down. All right. You give Zach Roper and the offensive staff, David Cutcliffe, a they kind of picked and choose spots tonight for tempo. You know what they haven't shown tonight yet? Yeah. That, the option package. Exactly. That, that It's flex bone, if you will, spread option package that, that Georgia Tech made famous in this conference that Army and Navy run. We have not seen that out of them yet. Oh, no flag. Looks like Miami got an early start. And another great catch, and that's Calhoun, the freshman. First and goal for Duke. It looked like a busted play. There was no whistle, no flag stopping the action. And it ended up being good for Duke. It's a back shoulder throw on a slot fade, and Calhoun comes up with a big play. Timeout for a player injury. Trayvon Hill is down. And grabbing his right hamstring. And we'll step aside here at oftentimes on offense, when you see a defensive end jump, the center will snap the ball and get it to the quarterback and get a free play. That is not what happened here. Will Taylor snapped it when he was not supposed to. He's only in his third start, inexperienced center, but Quentin Harris does a great job of just continuing to play, and they get their longest gain of the second half, an 18-yard completion. No question. First and goal now for Duke. Trailing four and Harris on the keep. And drives it down to about the two. In fact, the first five drives in the second half netted Duke 17 yards. They've now got about 38 on this drive. And a great field position to start the drive as well helps. Down four, though. Quick give, Deion Jackson, and the Duke touchdown. Little quick hitter with Jackson. It's a really nice job of Duke making plays. The long pass to Jalen Calhoun, followed by just a little handoff up the middle, a little dive play. And Jackson able to find a seam and get in the end zone. And we talked about the ups and downs for Miami. Now they're going to have to respond. But a great job of Duke on senior day being able to make some plays for their guys at home. Six plays, 40 yards, under two minutes. 149 the time of the drive. And the Blue Devils trying to push the advantage to three. And the extra point is good. Squeezed it inside the right upright. Deion Jackson, his sixth rushing score of the year. To Allstate. Duke is back in front, 20 to 17. Blue Devils wearing the old script Duke logoed helmets tonight. I like that, don't you? Little HBC influence in the uniform tonight. <laughs> there you go. Three point lead after Deion Jackson's touchdown with 9.37 to play. Charlie Ham out of Westminster in Atlanta bangs it away, and here's Jeff Thomas trying to get going. Thomas to the far side, and Ham with the shoe top tackle. Let's check with Kevin Connors. A West seven lead changes in the Iron Bowl, 78 points, and we're still only in the third quarter. Jalen Waddell has a 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown, 58 and 12-yard TD grabs. Anders Carlson just kicked a field goal for Auburn. They are back on top, 40-38, late third. Wes. Somebody has called Tuscaloosa and Auburn and gotten into a whack game. Yeah. <laughs> The whack has shown up in the SEC. How about the finish that that's going to be, though? First and ten. Here's the toss on the far side to Burns. And we're going to call that a pass. Maybe second down coming up. Hayward to stop. Don't forget LSU A&M tonight. 
Also in the SEC West at 7 p.m. on ESPN. And with Nikosi Perry now in the game for Miami, they, they may think they need more mobility back there. With Jaron Williams back there, he is, even when he's able to escape the pocket, he's not a run threat. With running situations, oftentimes Perry could be the one to pull that extra defender out of the box with his running ability. Perry going to take the shot downfield. Harley there, and it got broken up. Played very well by Michael Carter. The junior from Douglasville, the strike safety for the Blue Devils. That's as textbook as you can play it. He's in phase with the defender with his elbow right in the right in the receiver's elbow. Turns around, knocks the ball away. Just a fantastic play by Michael Carter. And with the struggles that Jaron Williams had a week ago, we thought we may see Nikosi Perry. And Eric, you're right. That mobility probably plays a big part of why we're seeing him. Well, how about the script being flipped from the pit game where Perry started, Williams came in, saved the day. Maybe Manny Diaz and Dan Enos now trying to turn to Perry to see if he can create a little late game magic. Perry will be, breaks away, and now backs up. Trying to find somebody, he'll sail it out of bounds. It looked like Hornbuckle had him dead to rights. Yeah, and when, and when Nikosi Perry came back to this side, to the side of the field that he rolled out to, Will Mallory saw him running and was turning the block. So he didn't even consider that the ball would be thrown. So Miami flagged for an ineligible downfield. They've now missed their last nine third downs. And I've got them for four straight three and outs, Roddy. And five of seven in the second half. And, and you just got a shot of Jaron Williams there on the sideline. And, and the Miami coaches told us that, how about the no sleeves there by Lou Headley? But the Miami coaches told us that they haven't, they hadn't benched Jaron Williams at this point because of performance. It's been because of injury, but they are getting benched for Nicosi Perry. Here's Hudzik, a spin to get him free, and then Jimmy Murphy dropping the hammer. The walk on from Avon, Connecticut. Takes down Miles Hudson. Don't forget Sports Center from Los Angeles tonight after Arizona, Arizona State with Stan and Neal, the best of college football's rivalry week. Plus, college football expert Heather Denich on which teams will make the playoff. We break down Hawks and Rockets as well. Sports Center after the college football duel in the desert on ESPN, the ESPN app. Trey Young went for 49 last night for the Hawks. 49 with the side of the L, Wes. Oh. Hawks struggling. My Hawks. <laughs> My Hawks, man. Deion Jackson, he'll get the carry on first down, and Jackson gets eight. Duke's got a little offensive momentum built up here, fellas, as we go toward eight minutes. There, there was an opportunity last week that the Duke defense had at the end of that FIU game to come up with a stop to be able to get the offense the ball back with a chance to win. Right. Once again, Miami's going to lean on this defense to try and get something going for an offense that has struggled in the second half. And Jackson denied on the second and short, so third and the same coming up for David Cutcliffe's team. By the way, Cutcliffe, with his three-point lead as we go under eight to play, and his team leading already has one big win on the weekend and we'll tell you about it in a moment because in our visit with him yesterday he was as proud of another team playing as just about anybody maybe sans their head coach and here's Harris the Blue Devils are first down as they cross midfield last night down in Oxford Mississippi David Cutcliffe's son Chris helped the Oxford Chargers beat Starkville to advance to the 6A state title game in the Magnolia State. And that's Chris with his quarterback after the win, and they avenge a loss early in the year in the Little Egg Bowl, Roddy. Yeah, yeah, it's David Cutcliffe. Here's Calhoun open on the Harris throw. Jalen Calhoun touchdown. On the last drive, Wes, it was Harris to Calhoun on that busted play. You see the excitement there from Quentin Harris on senior day. He's able to connect. It looked like the defender covering Jalen Calhoun fell down. That was number 30, Romeo Finley, turning him wide open. Calhoun able to get into the end zone for the easiest touchdown that he'll have maybe in his career. But 
once again. The senior quarterback coming through in the clutch on senior night for the Duke Blue Devils. The point after is good. It's a nine point game with under seven to go. Well, you see Romeo Finley on Jalen Calhoun in the slot, and when he tries to flip his hips, just gets his feet tangled up and falls down. And in man-to-man -man coverage with a safety in the middle of the field, there's going to be nobody behind Romeo Finley to cover Calhoun. And uh, it's an easy pitch and catch, but on a day like today, it's not something that you take for granted. Quentin Harris gets him the ball, and Duke now up 10 against the Miami team that has had nothing on offense recently. 10-point advantage for the Blue Devils. Harris is now scored on the ground and thrown for another in his final home game at Wallace Wade Stadium. I'm telling you, these games sometimes storylines can get pretty interesting. Well, look, I, I, you can't take away from what Duke has done so far in this game. It's been a sloppy game. It's been in the rain, in the cold, and they have battled. Miami suffered some injuries, and they're going to have to overcome that on offense to be able to get back in this football game. But Miami is staring 6-6 six and six in the face if they're not able to get something going. End over end kick. There'll be no return. Canes will scrimmage from their 25, and... Let's see who's looking good today. Brought to you by DXL, big and tall, Roddy. Well, in the first half, it was Cameron Harris. Or, excuse me. It was Jalen Calhoun just on the touchdown that we saw that's looking good. I and mean, that's just a fantastic pitch and catch there from Quentin Harris to Jalen Calhoun, taking advantage of a mistake on the Miami defense. And honestly, the way Miami's offense has performed so far, you're just not sure as we see once again Nikosi Perry in a quarterback. Yep, here is Perry to run the offense. A quick throw and a slant for Harley that will get him eight. And second down coming up. Calhoun, by the way, fourth touchdown catch of the year. He leads the Blue Devils in that category. Gray has three. Aaron Young, three. Deion Jackson, a couple, as does Scott Bracey. Little pistol set here from Dan Enos on second and two. Try and run it with Robert Burns, and he will have the first down to the 37. Now, Miami doesn't have to go fast here, but, but they can't quite go at the same tempo that they've been going. You need two scores, so you're going to need a stop in there as well, and here they go with a little bit of tempo. Yep. Perry, oh, reroutes and splits through two defenders, and Nikosi Perry takes off. First down into plus territory to the Blue Devil 45. And this is exactly why Perry is in the game. The right guard Hillary will get smoked right off the bat. But what Perry gives you is the escapability. I mentioned Williams does not have the speed that Perry does. And as hard as it is to complete balls in the rain right now, that speed could give them the chunk plays they need to get some points on the board here. Yep. Interesting to see how this one develops now. Plus field on first and 10 off the 46. Perry flips it across. There's Harley. And he'll have almost another first down. In fact, he'll have the first down. 35 yard line, 11 yards before Carter shoved him out. And that looked like that scramble just is giving Miami a little bit of momentum. Chris Rumpf in the backfield. Nikosi Perry able to throw over him. Harley able to get the first down, as you said. And Nikosi Perry's going to have to deal with this because of the injuries they've had up front. You talked about Zelante Hillary, number 75 at right guard in due to injuries. Duke's going to take a timeout. Second catch of the ball timeout. game for Mike Harley. Duke, the first of a half. And now Duke burns timeout. that timeout. So in the rain, David Cutcliffe, 10 point lead, 519 to play. He's trying to stop a five game skid. Six of their last seven games, the Blue Devils have fallen short. The defensive side of the ball has held up a good bit of this night, though. They certainly have. They've been all over. First, it was Jaron Williams. 
They've done a great job of covering everyone, really with the exception of, of Will Mallory in the first half, but it was really the pressure, their ability to get into the backfield. And, and Danny knows the offensive coordinator for Miami told us this wasn't a great matchup for them because of the activity that Duke has, because of the ability that Duke has, and Chris Rump especially has been all over the field. The question when Victor DiMichaji went out was who was going to provide the spark up front. Seven sacks, Chris Rump has led the way. Yep. And it's a defense, as we said at the top, it's going to be, it's taken some lumps at times this year, but returns a good bit of experience from this group next year from Matt Guerrero. And Ben Albert, they think they've got a real chance to have a really good defense in 2020. Perry, straight drop. Holds up, looking for the deep shot, and Harley batted away in the end zone. Michael Carter right there with Mike Harley. You know, Harley burst on the scene a couple weeks ago against Louisville, had two touchdown catches over 100 yards on six grabs, and it looks like Miami is trying to get him to go big play again here in the fourth. Well, it's a, it's a really nice job of Michael Carter, who was beat. He ends up recovering, and once he gets to the receiver, he looks back. What Harley can do to help out is come back to that ball and jump for it or come back aggressively because then he's going to draw the flag, and Mi Miami's going to get yardage out of it. 5-11 to go, Perry, straight drop, and a sack. Guess who? 96 again. And this time, they start, they pick on the left guard, and that's Ja'Kai Clark, who had to flip over from the right guard spot. But what Matt Guerrero does in his defensive scheme, he'll line up three down linemen on the line of scrimmage. He'll pull Rump off the ball, and they will they will run a line game. They'll run a twist off of one of the offensive linemen, and it's extremely tough to pick up. They throw back, and it's caught. Pope falling down makes the grab. That's a sensational catch if it's ruled one. They're going to call it a juggle and incomplete for Mark Pope. It's a fantastic throw and catch no matter what. Let's see. Knees down. Yeah, it's a really good call by the referees of getting that right. You see his rear end is out of bounds when he's able to actually secure it. If he catches it clean there, he's fine. But it's the bobble with his bottom out of bounds where he's able to re when, when he's able to finally gain control of it. Really good job of the referees getting together, talking about it, and then deciding the right call. You see Troy Gray, the head linesman, he was the first to enter the picture from the left side to indicate that, you know, the juggle was there, and now he's talking with Trey Blake, our referee. Well, and he's all, he's all over it. You see right there. Yeah, he doesn't have it when, when he hits he, out of bounds. Exactly, when yep. he finally secures it, he's already out of bounds. It's just a nice job, and, and these referees have an incredibly hard job. I mean, seeing that in real time, it's split seconds that they're having to make these determinations, but seeing the bobble, seeing the body out of bounds, it's the right call there. All right, 439 to go here. Uh, the ruling on After the field. After review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. So there Four we go. Foul. The review confirms. You have to go for it. Right. You, there's, there's no way you can punt the ball away, get the ball back in enough time to have two scores, you have to go for it because you're going to need a stop no matter what. And now both schools down to the two timeouts as well. Yep. So the question is, what do you do? Likely in this situation, you're going to try and get guys running the defenders off and then some sort of either in-breaking or out-breaking route right at the sticks. Well, keep an eye on the tight end, too. Will Mallory's been very quiet here in the second half after exploding in the first. Perry shoots it back across the field and almost intercepted. Waters had a beat on it. And Miami gives it back on downs at the Duke 43. Well, the other part of that is that Miami has to protect for long enough to be able to do it because of the color in Nikosi Perry's face. He flushes a little bit, and there was no doubt where he was going with that ball. It was to Will Mallory. Waters all over it. Almost picked it off there, but either way, Duke's able to get off the field, and they're going to be able to drain this clock and make it really hard for Miami to come back. Well, and the Canes with two timeouts and needing two scores here, Roddy and Eric, they've got to be fairly deliberate about where they use the timeouts. You've almost got to let Duke play two or three snaps here. Yeah. You're going to have to let them run the first. Duke's going to run the ball three times. Run the first, let the clock go down, and then call two timeouts if you're able to stop them on the next two. Here is Harris. He'll just keep it. 
And gets three to the 45. Let's check with Kevin. West Jalen Waddell has completely and totally taken over the Iron Bowl. Four catches for 98 yards, three of them for touchdowns. He's also returned a kick 98 yards for a touchdown. Alabama eyeing its ninth straight 11-win season. They're up 45-40. Meantime, Navy, Houston, Malcolm Perry and the midshipmen trying to pick up another W before the Army-Navy game. You can see the start of this game on the ESPN app, and then... Once things go final between Duke and Miami, you'll see it here on ESPN2, Wes. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate your good work today. Here's Harris again keeping it. Wow. Big collision as he turned the corner with Gervin Hall. So maybe a yard for Quinn Harris, and there's Miami. the Miami timeout. Their second of the half. 30 seconds. Leaves him with one and 342 to go. I'm going to go back to something that Kevin just said. Jalen Waddle's day. I mean, all the talk about Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs, and then Jalen Waddle comes and takes over in the Iron Bowl. Absolutely incredible. But, but this this Miami team calling the timeout. You, you got to think if they're able to get the ball back, you got to go down quick and score. Then it's going to be an onside kick situation because they're going to be left with no timeouts. Right. You're not going to be able to stop it. So a long shot right now for Manny Diaz who. In a season of ups and downs, losing to an FIU team a week ago, followed by a Duke team that's not going to a bowl game, man, that is going to leave a sour taste in the mouth of all Miami fans. Yep, sure is, and certainly for the head coach too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and look, this is an incredibly talented Miami football team, but there's something going on behind closed doors that's going to have to be rectified from a culture standpoint with, without being in the rooms on a day in day out basis you don't know exactly what it is but this miami program needs a mental revamp to get back to where they think they belong which is national prominence right third down and seven harris gonna keep it and only get a yard maybe jonathan ford there and miami takes the last time out with 336 to go Well, 10-point lead for the Blue Devils on Manny, Manny Diaz's final timeout. We told you that David Cutcliffe in 12 years has done just a marvelous job here, but Roddy, they've changed the culture. When he got here, they were just hoping for, you know what, give me four, give me five. Well, <laughs> guess what? Now, not going to a bowl game is disappointing. It, it, and it's incredible. We talked to David Cutcliffe yesterday about it. Now, the, the missing a bowl game, that's the anomaly for this Duke program. And when we asked him about it, he basically said, look, these guys, for them, tradition is the last four or five years. We, you just saw the graphic. They've been going to bowls year in and year out, really since 2012. So the tradition that they know is a winning football program. And, and, and in large part, the rise of the ACC from a football standpoint is largely reflected on what David Cutcliffe's done here. I mean, the bottom part of the ACC, which yep. used to be Duke, has gotten so much better that there's no easy wins on a week-in, week-out basis. Our colleague Tom Lugabill often refers to Duke as programs that you could sometimes put the win in pen, yep. and now you have to put them in pencil. And, and that volatility, by the way, or, you know, that competitive nature of this league, has now gone just about top to bottom through all 14 schools. Well, it, it is it is certainly competitive. There's no team that, like you said, you walk out and say, hey, I'm going to win today. Even a Duke team this year that struggled has come out and played well on a day like today. Ball from Parker is hammered, and Osborne going to let it hit, and it jumps into the end zone. So Miami scrimmages from its 20. And here's the eight seasons before David Cutcliffe and the 12 after. <laughs> Oh. Absolutely incredible. And that's with four seasons, essentially, 08, 9, 10, and 11, where he's having to rebuild this thing from the studs. But since 2012, they have really taken off. Two-time ACC Coach of the Year, had an ACC Championship game appearance as well, has put numerous quarterbacks in the NFL, including Danny Dimes a year ago in the first round. <laughs> you like yeah, that, don't you? I do, yeah. yeah. The Giants fans on our crew, I think, like it more. <laughs> 
Here's Perry eluding the rush. Now breaks it back down and going to run with it. And he'll get out of bounds, stopping the clock with 3.20 to go after a run of five. Don't leave out my man Thad Lewis, who I, who I snapped to up in Buffalo. And those two quarterbacks, when they get to the league, think Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. Those are huge names. Yep. But then you look at a guy like Daniel Jones last year. He comes into the NFL extremely prepared. I played with Thad Lewis, an extremely smart quarterback. That is what David Cut Cutcliffe can instill in his QBs. There's a throw across the field. Harley got knocked down. Carter was there. In fact, he was the closest guy to the ball. And, and I'll be honest with you, Eric, there's a guy like Anthony Boone who helped him get to the championship yeah. game that never got really a crack at the next level. And I don't know what Quentin Harris's football future will be like, but this is a good kid who's a good football kid who, you know, has taken a benefit from, from working with David Cutcliffe and whoever followed. And really, I think that's one of the big questions yeah. facing this team in 2020. And Cutcliffe said that yesterday. He certainly did, and he really put it on himself. He said, I've got to figure out the quarterback position. There's enough talent coming back where if we figure that out, we'll be pretty good. Yep. Look at all the young guys we've called out today. There's a throw for uh, Wiggins. Overshot and incomplete, and now all of a sudden it's fourth down and five with under three to go, and Miami needs two scores. I'll say this. You cannot ever imagine how good a job he's done here just making the program in competitive nature to what the league was doing because you mentioned 12 years ago he arrived Paul Johnson came to Georgia Tech to kind of extend their run early when you were playing for him there are a lot of programs that that kind of had to find the compass to compete in the in the new world we were living in college football here's Perry skating away he'll have the first down a little high step and then Waters slings him to the turf and, and likewise, to your point, and Eric, I'd love to know what you think. Roddy, you said Miami's got to find that. Miami's got to find the new Miami, you know, because these guys, do they know about the, I mean, they know about them because they're on the walls and they celebrate title teams and so forth. But Miami's got to find kind of their offense. point, you know, yeah. their northern star, if you will. Well, well, Eric, Eric played Close with now. the last, really the last one of those great teams, the last player from one of those great teams that still play in the NFL, Frank Gore. Right. Was able to talk to him earlier this week, he would. Yeah, so I talked to Frank Gore this week, which congratulations to Frank Gore, third all-time runner, uh, rushing leader in the NFL history. Phenomenal. What he's doing at his current age of 35, 36 years old, absolutely phenomenal. When I talked to him this week, Week. He's disappointed in the program. You know, last week was a down moment. There's a fumble, and Duke's out of there with it, and Kwanzaa's got the rock. They finally got around Perry, back it loose, and Kwanzaa falls on there. It's been pressure the entire second half that's been the story. This beat up Miami offensive line. It's not held up well, and you see big number 95, Trayvon, Trayvon McSwain, yep. McSwain, right there, diving to swipe the ball out. If you see poor ball security, just swipe at it. See what happens? McSwain's able to get the ball on the ground, and, and Miami can't stop the clock now, so Duke is going to be able to drain off the majority of the rest of this time on their way to their fifth win of the year. Yep. We'll see what Harris does here to get the clock rolling with 2.17 to go. Eric, I do want you to be able to finish about your comments and visit with Frank Gore. Here's Harris. He'll take a dive back at the 34. Yeah, so back on to what Frank Gore said. Yes, Frank Gore is disappointed in the program right now. And last week against FIU, what a low moment that was for this program. But he does feel like there's enough talent in Miami, enough talent in the state of Florida, that if Manny Diaz and his staff can recruit well and instill a culture, we, Manny Diaz said it this week, of passion. Those guys in the early 2000s, they played with such tremendous passion that week in and week out, Miami football looked a little different on TV than the rest of the country, and you just don't see that anymore. And it, you know, it's a different culture of kid coming out of high school, and there's yep. a lot of factors that go into it. This is not a shot at the current coaching staff by any means, but Frank timeout. does feel like he could be Duke, their second of the half, 30 second timeout. He is confident in, in, in this staff and through his interactions with them so far. Well, I think Frank Gore brings up some good points, and Manny Diaz talks about 
the history of Miami. And that's why I think he was quick to say how disappointing last Saturday night was, especially when you look at this, Roddy. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at what the Hurricanes NFL draft classes used to look like. I mean, go back and look at the, the 01 team, the 2000 team, the 2002 team, and obviously this team in the 2004 NFL draft, the first round selection's incredible. It's an NFL record. And, and, and Miami's just not there yet. You know, th this was a program once upon a time that was churning these guys out because of the depth, because of the competitiveness. Not only do you have to recruit well, but you have to develop well, which is another big thing that Manny Diaz is going to have on his plate as he looks to rebound from certainly a disappointing regular season. He's going to have an opportunity in the bowl game to ride it, but man, this was a team that was expected to compete at the top of the coastal. Here's Harris again, just falling to the turf. Third down coming up. Clock will continue to run. Romeo Finley was the closest guy to him. We told you at the half, David Cutcliffe's mark as the Duke coach was not very good when trailing at the half. They're going to win today when trailing at the half. And the last time they trailed at the half and won was a year ago at Miami. Wow. And by the way, they're going to beat Miami for consecutive years for the first time. Wow. And I only their fourth win all time against the Canes. They won the very first meeting. October of 1976. I, I, that was a different world for both programs. <laughs> yeah, it was a different world in the world. Yeah. Uh, I, I think for this for this Duke team, you can't say enough about the way they've come out and perform on Senior Day. Ten point lead for Duke. Let's check with Kevin. Wes, we've just had our ninth lead change in the Iron Bowl. Nine of them. We'll tell you about that in just a bit. Want to let you know Navy in Houston is underway over on ESPN News. Navy. Had a chance to win the America West. Had Cincinnati knocked off Memphis yesterday. Didn't happen, but they can get to seven conference wins on the season. Navy Houston underway on ESPN News, and it'll be full here on ESPN2 when things go final in Durham. Wes. Kevin, thanks very much. And while Duke burns this last time out, a uh, quick thanks to our producer, Chris Damiani, our director, Adam Bryant. And Roddy, with you and Eric, uh, let me extend our thanks to all the great men and women that have been a part of our crew here during the regular season. It's been absolutely fantastic. You can't ask for a better group. You know, we, we, when we get to know each other over the course of the year, it almost becomes like family. So yep. appreciate all you guys for everything during the regular season as we get into the postseason. Yep. Fabulous to be with these folks in our coverage of college football this fall. How about the, 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 the awesome feeling for not only the seniors, but also the underclassmen, getting this win for their guys and, and really being able to send them out the right way. Uh, I, I was not able to win on my senior day, but it looks like uh, Duke certainly will. You see the emotion on the face. I was not either, Roddy, and uh, I, I wish I could have the feeling that these guys are feeling. I'm standing right behind them as they go out on the field. What a feeling it is for these guys. Trayvon McSwain, pretty emotional. As the clock winds to zero, David Cutcliffe and Duke go five and seven in the regular season. A postseason opportunity for Miami as they finish with two straight losses and six and six. And Quentin Harris is able to write his senior script as well. Well, it has, the not Blue been, to a win. it has not been the season that Quentin Harris expected, but what a way to finish for an incredible young man. 10 point win for the Blue Devils for Roddy Jones, Eric Wood, and our great crew, West Durham. Blue Devils beat the Canes 27 17. Off